who will, will, will give you some assistance. Um, I'd now like to call on the chair of the forum, Professor uh, Louise Richardson, who will just do a brief address bef before we start our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ber Bernie. D. E. Vicorda, Fafaltura of Galera and Sean Yu. Um, delighted to see you all here for the third day of the Consultative Forum on uh, International Security Policy. Today we're going to continue uh, exploring the changing context for Ireland's foreign policy. We're going to continue to examine the assumptions that underline uh, our positions and invite discussion about our role in the world. And in doing so, today we're going to build on the uh, work of the previous uh, panels in Cork and Galway. Um, in Cork, we looked at the global security environment, at the European security post-Ukraine, and we examined new and emerging threats like cybersecurity and maritime security. We then, on day two in Galway, uh, looked at our global role in the United Nations. We examined our peacekeeping tradition, our role in conflict resolution, and looked at research and innovation in this sphere. So today we're going to have a very packed day. We're going to have three panels on working with partners, uh, two panels on learning from our neighbors, and a special address from Antishak. Um, so we have a packed agenda, and notwithstanding some empty chairs, I, I, they will all fill as people find their way here today. But we are going to uh, keep to time. So if, um, if you're out having coffee, um, the panel will still start without you. So, so please try and get to your seats so we can get through this packed agenda. Um, and in keeping with this theme of ensuring that uh, as many people as possible can participate, uh, I would invite you to keep your interventions as, as succinct and brief as possible. Again, not to constrain speech, but only to maximize opportunities for participation. As Bernie said, we'll be using Slido. And again, uh, the reason for this uh, um, is to facilitate maximum participation. If you don't get a chance to ask your own question, but feel that the issue you'd like to raise has been addressed in one of the questions that has been placed on Slido, you can indicate your support for that question being answered. Again, it's our way of trying to maximize participation. Um, in the interest of transparency, we would ask that you, when you post a question or intervention on Slido, that you would identify yourself. And similarly, when you speak from the floor, we'd be grateful if you could introduce yourself. Um, when you participated in the forum or registered for the forum, you'll have received a copy of the guiding principles um, that, uh, that we plan to operate throughout the, these discussions. Um, and the point here is, is to ensure freedom of speech without fear of um, personalized criticism. Um, everyone ha will have an equal right to participate, but nobody will have the right to deny another the right to speak. So again, we would, uh, I do as I always do, invoke the uh, Augustinian precept of audi alterum partum, listen to the other side, uh, the goal is to the, the success of this entire venture is directly correlated to the uh, extent of the participation in constructive debate. Um, so the choreography is that each panel will have a moderator and that moderator will ensure that about half of the time of the panel will be given over to discussion amongst the panelists and half to interventions from the floor or Slido. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. I'd like to invite uh, Rory Montgomery, who is Honorary Professor at Queen's University Belfast in the Mitchell Institute for International Peace, and he will be the moderator of the first panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just want to say personally, it's a great honour and privilege for me to be taking part uh, in a conference with so distinguished uh, an Irish woman with such a great career. Um, and just to repeat very briefly what the chair said about the spirit uh, of the forum, one of inclusivity and openness, um, no personalized attacks uh, or criticism will be uh, allowed. Um, which doesn't mean that you can't say absolutely what is on your mind. Um, again, to say that interventions from the floor 
uh, should be brief and focused on the topic being discussed. Now, this panel is intended to explain what the EU's common security and defence policy is and what it does and what it isn't and what it doesn't do. There's a later panel this morning on, specifically on Ireland and the CSDP. Now, there's clearly an overlap um, between these two panels, but I hope our focus can be mostly on the broader context in, in this discussion. There will be 30 minutes of moderated discussion with our three panellists, whom I'll introduce in, in a moment. Um, but again, just to repeat what the, um, what the Chair said, at least half the time will be given over to comments and questions from you in the room. Um, I'll take a few questions directly from the floor. Uh, again, please identify yourself, um, who you are, and if you're representing a particular organisation. Um, important to be succinct, maximum two minutes, because I think we all want to hear as many voices as possible. Um, given the large number of people present, the best way, however, to cover the most ground in the time available uh, is to use Slido. Again, information is there, um, and it's, I can tell you, I'm having used it myself, it's, it's, it's surprisingly user-friendly. Um, but if you have any difficulty in using it, um, there are staff members around, and they will help you. Um, and just to be very clear, um, when submitting a question um, through Slido, in the same way as if you ask a question from the floor, please uh, give your name. And I won't take anonymous questions. Uh, and again, as the Chair said, you can like other questions you wish to see answered using the thumbs up option. In other words, it's not necessary for lots of people to ask the same question. Um, okay, do you introduce the panel in alphabetical order? We've Kenneth McDonough, who's an Associate Professor of International Relations at Dublin City University, specialising in the EU's foreign and security and defence policies on which he has written extensively. Um, then next is Stein Molz, who's a, a Belgian diplomat who has served in a wide variety of posts at home and abroad, uh, including at the Belgian permanent representation to the European Union, which is probably home and abroad for a, a Belgian. Um, he was seconded to the European External Action Service in 2021 as Head of Division for Security and Defence Policy. And Maura O'Sullivan um, is uh, an officer of Angara Giacona, but since 2006 her career has been largely and then exclusively focused on a range of international missions, mostly EU, but also in, with the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, and she's been in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Kosovo, in Georgia, and North Macedonia. And since 2017, she's been a member of the EU's advisory mission in Ukraine, and she was appointed deputy head of mission two months ago. Just one little anecdote um, about Maura. Uh, we had last week a sort of preparatory video session, uh, Zoom session, to talk about uh, today. Uh, and we'd be talking for about five minutes when Maura very calmly said, that there had been a, a sort of rocket attack alert and she made her way down to the, the basement and she resumed uh, the discussion with great calm um, a few minutes later. So that's kind of life in Ukraine, but you'll maybe say a bit more about that when we, when we come on. So let's begin, let me begin with Ken. Um, why, why, why does the EU have a common security and defence policy and, and what are its kind of broad purposes. We'll talk about in detail about what it does in a moment, but why is it there? Um, yeah, so I suppose the first thing to remember is European integration has always had a security and peace component and, and motivation, going back to the very foundation of, of the European institutions. Um, the reason we have European integration was to, to copper fasten peace, peace and stability um, on, uh, on the continent. What developed and evolved after that, of course, is from the 1970s onwards with European political cooperation, which was the attempt to coordinate um, external policy among the member states. Um, but by the 1990s, we're in a, a rapidly changing environment, and it's sort of in response to the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Warsaw Pact, and we have the emergence of the CFSP pillar under the European Treaty Structures, first with, with Maastricht. That said, there isn't the same focus on a, a European capability development um, at, at, at that time. And really the stimulus for that is the wars in the former Yugoslavia um, and the, the inability, in a sense, of, of the European Union to take concerted action to prevent genocide on the continent of Europe. 
Um, and it's from the embers of that, that that the idea of a CSDB focused on developing a distinctive European capability to respond to crises in its neighbourhood, humanitarian action, peacekeeping operations, and so on, um, it evolves from the late 1990s into the 2000s. Um, to that end, the, Euro the European Union starts to develop its own, for the first time, a European security strategy in 2003, though there's some criticism as to what extent that was really a strategic document rather than something that was a little bit more aspirational and in some ways um, setting a, a distinct European identity in international affairs separate to the United States. Uh, but from 2003 onwards, we have the first European flagged missions, uh, both military and civilian, um, in, in, in the field. And there have been a considerable number of those, although we could argue there's probably two phases in, in the deployment of missions. Up till about 2008, 2009, there's considerable peacekeeping operations on the military side. And since then, there's perhaps been a shift more towards training and capacity building of partner states rather than the European Union pushing forward. The other strand of that in terms of capability building is the, the battle group concept. Um, and again, this was the idea that the EU would have a, a deployable component in the event of a crisis. Um, though in reality, the battle groups have tended to be more about fostering interoperability, fostering cooperation among European, among European militaries. A parallel track then to that from 2004 onwards is the development of the European Defence Agency um, and the idea that Europe would address its own defence industrial base to give it a certain amount of autonomy um, in, in developing and dealing with the gaps in European, European capabilities. And then just to, to maybe finish off in terms of where the CSTP is in terms of the, the treaties, the Treaty in the European Union, better known as the Lisbon Treaty, introduces a, 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 what's called a mutual defence clause in Article 42.7. Um, albeit one that recognises the, the distinct uh, security policies and um, orientation of, of the member states within that. Just one little follow-up. Um, the term battle group has raised concerns in, in Ireland. What is a battle group? So it's, it's standing for us. The, the idea is that he would have two battle groups ready uh, and operational, um, rotating on six-month periods. They would have a lead, a, a lead partner um, and it's a number of force minute, 1,500, 2,500, um, covering an array of, of sort of military capabilities. The initial thinking or the way they were, they were presented was that these would be the ones that would be called upon to take action if the EU is deploying a mission in the field. However, decisions on that remain at the intergovernmental level and, and at, the, the, at the level of unanimity. And therefore, there hasn't been an occasion when I suppose the precise configuration of member states willing to participate in a mission and member states currently cooperating in a battle group have, have sort of matched up exactly and been deployed um, in, in that formation. So in reality, what they tend to be are almost operational training exercises to, for, for European militaries to work together, get used to working together, understand where the gaps are in their, in, their, in their capabilities and how they might be met by other partner states within the European Union, as well as strong sort of socialization function for, for members of European Defence Forces to, to get to know how, how, their, how their counterparts work, work in other countries. And I'm right, just finally, I'm right in thinking that battle group is a kind of a term of, of art um, in, in military matters. Yeah. I think it's a, is it a tactical group in French? Yes, it's a, it's a, a, a tactical group is, is the, French, the, the French translation for that. And uh, that's really what it's about. It's about sort of that, that, that sort of tactical cooperation, understanding how different militaries might work together and how they can slot in and what sort of different formations would work well. Thank you very much. Uh, Stein, can I turn to you? You're very much in the engine room of the CSDP. Maybe you might say, what are the, what are the main things it's doing or is happening under it at the moment? And looking to the future, how is it planned that it might develop? Uh, thanks, Rory. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, Ken, for, for the overview. I think as Ken, uh, uh, what, what's Ken, what Ken's intervention illustrates is how flexible and adaptable the CSSP has been over the last 20 years, and I think that's really one of the, one of the main characteristics. Uh, perhaps to start off with a few uh, disclaimers first. Uh, first to say that, um, of course, when we speak about security and defense, a large part of the competences reside at member states level. So we work with a very few exceptions on the basis of unanimity and in full respect of, of member states' competences. We are also not in the business of building a European army. We're trying to stimulate cooperation between member states in the field of security and defense. We're trying to coordinate member states' action in terms of capability development. There's no 
Um, there is no agenda to build a European army in any way. Uh, we are also not in the business of self-defense. In fact, that's also very clearly stated in the treaty, references to NATO, Irish protocol, etc. Um, there is no duplication with NATO. And of course, CSDP is not only about military tools. Quite the contrary. I think the uniqueness of CSDP is that it combines civilian and military tools in what we call the integrated approach, so that it also brings together increasingly economic tools, um, uh, issues of law, humanitarian aid, uh, and, and so on. I think if you look at what we are doing um, in CSDP currently, uh, there's a few points I'd like to outline. First, we're trying to build a better common understanding of the world we face in the hopes of building an increasingly strategic culture amongst ourselves. Because if you don't have a common understanding of the threats and challenges you face, it's not possible to act. And there I think the picture is quite dire at this point in time. We're, we're as Europe, we are in danger. These are the words of our high representative, uh, Mr. Borrell. Uh, we are faced with an increasingly alarming number and intertwined uh, threats, and these are not only military in nature, um, certainly not. The second is that we're beefing up our capacity to act um, as a crisis management uh, actor abroad. Um, this is the first chapter of the strategic compass, um, and, and for instance, strengthening our military and civilian CSDP tools. And S sorry, Stan, you might yeah. just explain what the strategic compass <coughs> is? Exactly. So the strategic compass, in fact, brings together in a very uh, conceptual and coherent way our action in the field of CSDP. It contains our agenda for the next five to ten years. It has four chapters, and each of these chapters end with a concrete list of actions that we seek to, uh, to pursue. So the first part is really the strategic culture, as I said, the threat analysis. The second is act. What are we to do in order to increase our capacity to act in the world? Then there is secure. How can we build resilience, not only our own resilience, but also the resilience of partners? Uh, for example, against increasing hybrid threats or disinformation campaigns, uh, cyber attacks, uh, etc. Uh, the third chapter is called Invest. This is about giving ourselves the capabilities, investing military and civilian side into the capacities we need in order to, um, to pursue these goals. And then the fourth chapter is about partners, meaning how to work with the UN with NATO, with third countries, in order to, to defend our interests in the world. And it, it basically outlines in a very strategic way what we are to do, but also in a very concrete way, with timelines, for instance, creating a rapid deployment capacity, as we call it, a 5,000-strong deployable um, military capacity uh, for crisis management operations abroad, building in part on the EU battle group uh, concept, but it also speaks about strengthening our small but efficient military and civilian headquarters we have in Brussels. It also speaks about the mutual assistance clause, Article 42.7, uh, and so on. Thank you. We might come back to the questions of common defense and the um, mutual assistance <coughs> clause, because I know that they, they generate quite a lot of concern and, and, and discussion. Um, you have both mentioned the uh, civilian side of, of CSDP, um, and Maura, as I said, you have um, really extensive experience um, in that. Maybe you might say a bit about well, what is meant um, by civilian as opposed to military, but then maybe a flavour of some of the things that you've done in your career. Thank you very much. And also for me, it is an absolute privilege to be here this morning. I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to have this broad discussion on all of the instruments and tools and aspects of, of this uh, security area. Um, I'd start just a little bit by focusing in on civilian missions and, and what, they, what the added value is of civilian missions. Um, essentially, civilian missions, part of the CSDP, the Common Security and Defence Policy, promote peace, security and stability beyond the borders of the European Union and play a pivotal role in preventing and managing conflicts and crises. And there's different um, aspects to this and the benefits of civilian missions. But just quickly, what is a civilian mission? It's essentially where non-military personnel are deployed to areas um, which can be either in a conflict or post-conflict. Um, and the missions focus on these different types of civilian missions, monitoring, capacity building, advisory tasks. And the missions work as well at different stages of conflict cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously, 
it's very important that uh, the civilian aspects of CSDP are promoted and enhanced as well, which they are being doing done through the strategic compass and also through something called compact, which I think we can, we can talk maybe a little bit more about later on. But what are the benefits? What are the added value of civilian? So obviously by fostering conditions for secure and stable environments outside the EU, it enhances security and secure and stable stability inside the EU. And the work that's done by the civilian missions, and this is by police, by um, lawyers, by people working in the justice sector, uh, by people from civil society, uh, who work with the host country. We enhance the security of the union and its citizens. And having um, this, <clears throat> looking at the external, security and stabilization and linking it in with the internal security and stabilization, it means that we can use all of these instruments and tools to, to enhance uh, security of citizens, essentially. Um, thirdly, this, it gives the opportunity for the EU to establish itself as a credible actor and a trustworthy actor on the international stage. The civilian CSDP missions showcase the EU's capacity to contribute effectively to international peace and security. And this with all the other EU actors, but also with, as Steen mentioned, the other international actors and the host countries, the counterparts in the host countries. It's absolutely necessary that we take a comprehensive approach to this and to the security challenges. And this is what's tried across uh, CSDP. Um, for my own experience, I mentioned there's different types of missions and uh, there's a lot of different people with different backgrounds, experience, who are uh, seconded to missions. I uh, was seconded to two missions through Angarda Siakana, the first one in Bosnia, that was a police mission. And there we were working, co-located with the police in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, to support them in enhancing and, and establishing and building up their own institutions. Obviously, human rights, gender, working with civil society, community dialogue, these are all parts of uh, the aspects of what we work with. And coming from a Garda background, uh, of course, these are all the, the principles that we, we uh, operate here as well. In Kosovo, which is a rule of law uh, mission, uh, I worked there on more on the operational planning side. But there, again, there was an executive side of the mission, but there was also monitoring, mentoring, advising, working with the local institutions. Georgia is a different type of mission, the EU monitoring mission in Georgia. There, the mission is, it's monitoring the compliance with the peace agreement. It's uh, monitoring the work of the police and the military in Georgia, the defense um, ministry in complying with this six-point agreement, which effectively uh, ended the conflict, the 2008 war in Georgia. But also the mission there monitors the situation, the human security situation, along the administrative boundary line with South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And now, since the full-scale invasion last year of Ukraine, this is more important than ever. And finally, the mission I work with at the moment, it's an advisory mission. The mission in Ukraine has actually been there since 2014 um, and has worked with the institutions working on security sector reform, civilian security sector reform. And we work with law enforcement agencies across different aspects um, of, of their development, capacity building, uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, in compliance, of course, with the international human rights standards and principles. So I'll, I'll stop there, but and yes, we just, can go back maybe exactly, to... Yeah. Yeah. No, just, um, Esteen, just to, to ask you, um, Ken said earlier on that the balance, if you like, between the military and the civilian has perhaps changed a bit since the early days. I mean, we had the... I remember very well, we had the mission in Chad, for example, um, where General Nash um, was, was, was in charge in Paris. What, what roughly is the balance, would you say, now between the two, the military and the civilian? It's a good question. I think we currently have nine military missions and operations and uh, 12 or 13 civilian missions. So I think that already gives you an indication. I think also in terms of the, the numbers of personnel deployed at this point in time, it's certainly more on the, on the civilian side than on the military side. 
Perhaps just to, comp to complement the picture that uh, Maura just, just depicted for the benefit of the audience in terms of uh, military missions and operations we have, there is also quite a wide scope of, of activity. And I think it really proves the point as to what CSDP is capable of um, uh, on the basis of, of member states agreement. Uh, we have four, I, I would dare to say, more traditional training missions ongoing currently in Africa. So with the armed forces of, uh, of Mali, Central African Republic, Somalia, and Mozambique. And these training missions really seek to help the uh, local authorities deal with, uh, for example, terrorist uh, insurgencies on their, or armed conflict on their territories. Um, we have two maritime operations. One is Ionafar Atalanta off the coast of Somalia, which I think has been very successful over the last years in terms of um, while shielding international maritime traffic, but also fighting the, um, um, the boats coming from, uh, from Somalia. Um, then uh, we have UNAF for Irini, um, which is guarding the UN arms embargo on, uh, on Libya. Uh, we have, of course, the executive um, military operation in, uh, in Bosnia, in Altia, um, which I think has been instrumental in ensuring a safe and, and secure uh, environment there. Um, and then, of course, we have um, new the newest additions to the, to the list of missions, um, one is uh, in Niger, a new uh, partnership mission uh, with a much more flexible and light footprint, also with the idea of in a partnership with the Nigerian authorities to help build their uh, capacity to deal with uh, ongoing security threats. And then we have IUMAM Ukraine, um, to which Ireland is, uh, is for that matter a very respected contributor. And this is the, the training mission, a very innovative again because its headquarters are actually based inside the European Union and some of its activity, most of its activity takes place on yeah, EU soil. And this mission aims to train the Ukrainian armed forces um, in a very successful uh, manner for that because by the end of this year it will have trained uh, approximately 30,000 soldiers and many member states chip in according to their own um, specialization and according to their own capacity. So trainings take place throughout Europe and it has been considered very successful in terms of contributing to the Ukrainian armed forces uh, readiness. Well, we've just mentioned, um, well, Ukraine has been mentioned twice. Um, of course, strategy, strategies uh, can be developed with great care and attention, but then uh, the real world has a habit of, uh, of intervening. And the strategic compass, I think, was adopted that you mentioned earlier, the, the broad sort of strategic plan and was adopted, if I'm right, in March 22, about exactly a month after the Russian invasion. So how would you say, well, I'm going to ask the question, how has Ukraine changed things um, as regards CSDP? Um, and maybe I, I'll begin with, with you, Maura. In terms of your day-to-day -day work, um, what exactly has, uh, and the objectives of your mission, um, what is different about, about now? Um, so I'm, I went to Ukraine in 2017 the first time, and um, having worked there before and after, obviously, the, the unprovoked aggression, um, which started a full-scale invasion, which started in February, um, to see, obviously, before February, we, in the mission, in the civilian mission, the advisory mission, we were able to uh, move around the country a lot more. Um, the security situation was a lot different there. What we uh, saw in February last year, on the broader scale, the, the responsiveness of the EU, so this unity, the political will um, to drive things forward. So our, our mission essentially, as I said, sec civilian security sector reform, we're an advisory mission. We do not have an executive function there. but. Immediately after uh, February, we uh, moved out of Ukraine uh, to Moldova, and there we looked to see how we could support Ukraine. We developed a concept for border support activities to facilitate the, the free movement of, of people and of goods and humanitarian aid. Um, so we had people on the ground, on the borders, monitoring and facilitating and advising there. We also very quickly developed a concept on international crimes, war crimes, um, and we put this forward as well uh, to that we could support in this area, which of course, it goes without saying, is an absolutely huge um, area which is going to go on for years and years. 
both of those activities were adopted extremely quickly by the EU Council. And I think it was the fastest ever mandate changes that, that we had. So that was something that, uh, that uh, made a big difference to us, that we were able to move forward, uh, develop our own organization, adapt our own organization, get the right expertise in, which came very quickly from the member states as well, particularly on the war crimes. Um, just a quick caveat, we have moved back now, as well as doing these areas, to doing more on the reform side, which is our core mandate, so just to mention that. But obviously, also for ourselves, the securitization of the state in Ukraine, and this is going to be a huge issue going forward as well. Um, the Ukrainians at the moment, the law enforcement agencies that we deal with, and I'm talking, I know, about a small part of the bigger picture, but the law enforcement agencies that we deal with, they are fighting a war, and they are also trying to continue maintaining the rule of law in the country. So resilience is a word we hear a lot of. We see it every single day in our work in Ukraine amongst our colleagues and the, our counterparts. And our role here, what we want to do is we want to support them now in the work that they're doing, but also uh, work on, on the future. Uh, one of the things, just one example, is uh, we have a concept for liberated and adjacent territories. And what that means is as territories are deoccupied, of course, the police, the authorities will move back in there. There are extraordinary challenges in front of people when they go in, starting with reconstruction, demining reconstruction, um, re-establishing police rule of law services, re-establishing trust, dealing with this issues of collaboration, all of these things um, alongside the psychological trauma that's there, the people coming back from the front, weapons that are uh, going to be uh, available in the community. So this has, of course, changed the environment that we're working in and that the Ukrainians are working in as we go forward. So we have to be ready for this and ready to adapt. Thank you. Just I have a little note saying that the volume is a little low at the back. So if the speakers could speak up and into the microphones. Um, one other thing, I, I don't see any Slido questions as yet. Um, and I would encourage, oh, there are, sorry. OK, here, here they are. OK, now, um, good, because I, I thought people were being remarkably uh, reticent. Um, on the, and of course, so, so, well, on the question of Ukraine, of course, Questions of rule of law and anti-corruption and so on are hugely important for Ukraine's EU membership application, so there's a link to the bigger picture there. Ken, in, in, in sort of conceptual terms, um, what has the Ukraine conflict um, changed in terms of the context in which discussion about the CSTP takes place? Yeah, well, I suppose as I, I, I mentioned in my initial remarks, the emergence of the CSTB has always been a response to that changed external environment and what we've had, I suppose, over the last just over 12 months now is another sort of radical shift in, 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 in the environment that we're, we're dealing with. You mentioned the Strategic Compass coming out uh, in March 2022 and obviously th there were some revisions on that in terms of the, the weighting given to different, different challenges. Um, so there has been a, a, a real shift in the understanding of the challenging security environment Europe finds itself operating in. I think what's been remarkable in response to, to Russia's invasion or its escalation of its invasion um, of, of Ukraine is the EU has shown its capacity to act quite, quite strongly. So if we look at the use of the European Peace Facility, we look at the unanimity around sanctions, um, the, the, the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive as well, you know, the EU has really shown a, a great capacity to respond um, to our crisis. But I also think there's been a little bit of a reality check about how far we are from perhaps where, where the EU would want to be in terms of its, its capability to act, to act independently. Um, and there's perhaps questions, and going back to that, que that conceptual idea, you know, given now that Sw F Finland have joined NATO, Sweden are, are, are on that pathway as well, um, the question of that balance between CSTP, between what, what falls under a NATO hat, what falls properly under an EU hat, that, that has shifted quite significantly. And the other little fly in the ointment, um, though I've, 
I suppose we all hope we get a, get a few days away from discussing Brexit. Um, <laughs> but, but, but having the UK outside of, of CSDP is, is quite significant in places, I suppose, a strong premium on, on dealing with um, you know, bringing the, the UK into the tent in discussions on how we deal with the challenges of security and defence in the European region. That's actually one of the questions um, in the slider list. Just, I mean, yeah, I mean, what is the relationship with the UK at the moment? And maybe, Steen, you could say? Um, it's, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, of course, we, um, we, we greatly regret that uh, uh, the UK has decided to, to leave the European Union. We're currently still in the process of, of basically rebuilding our relationship in the field of, of security and defence. Um, with UK, I think that the, the, the Windsor Agreement um, will provide a new, a new pathway to that. Uh, the TCA already has a number of elements in it on which we can uh, build our cooperation with the UK, including, for instance, on, on cyber defense, um, which, is what we, uh, which is what we are doing. Um, and, um, I mean, in, in the broader picture, I think the, um, the ball is largely in, in the UK's hands at this point in time. I think there is great willingness on our side to continue to, to engage with the UK. I think through the European political community, which is outside CSDP and which had uh, its second meeting in, uh, in Moldova a few weeks back, um, we have now a new forum that allows us to consult in a more informal setting on security and, and defense issues uh, with the UK as well. So I think that's very positive and it's uh, the sign of, the, of our increasingly engagement. Um, and of course, over time, we hope that there might be a possibility to restart the conversation about uh, UK participation to our missions, etc. Uh, sorry, I, I sort of got a little off topic there. Um, just, to, just again, what would you highlight in the light of what um, Ken said uh, as the main uh, changes uh, to CSDP over the last year? I mean, as well as the question of unity and, and, and speed of of action and so on? Um, I, I think Ken listed most of them. For me, it's first and foremost, of course, the threat environment. We already knew that we were facing a, a much different world, uh, but the Russian uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine has, has confirmed that, and in, in a way that, of course, not everybody saw coming, even until a few days before the invasion. Uh, so, of course, it's right that the strategic compass was adopted less than four weeks after Russia's invasion. But it's important to say that it's not only a reaction to that invasion. In fact, the compass was started, and discussions on the compass started almost two years earlier. Yeah. Of course, in, in that span of time, in those four weeks, we've given it a long and hard look to see what needs to be changed. And if I, if I look what has changed, of course, it's, it's a threat perception and much stronger language on Russia and on, on the military threats. It's also about EU-NATO cooperation, because I think we are increasingly aware um, I would dare to say about a certain level of mutual dependency, because of course there is the issue of capabilities we have on the European side, but there is also the issue of who has the best tools at its disposal to deal with the threats we currently face. And I think what we see on the back of the, of the war in Ukraine is that EU-NATO cooperation has really um, moved up to, uh, to a new level. And part of the explanation for that is if you look at the threats we are facing, many of the tools are in fact available at the EU side or at member state side and cannot be dealt with by, by NATO alone. Um, of course, Denmark has decided to, uh, to rejoin CSDP. That for us is also a very important development. Sweden and Finland were mentioned. And I think basically um, we have in a certain way um, I think the most important point, as, as outlined by Ken, is that uh, we have acted in a very unified, coherent, and unprecedented way if you look at the, at the Russian invasion in Ukraine, perhaps to the surprise of the outside world, perhaps in some cases to our own surprise. But I think it also illustrates that where there is political will, the issue of unanimity, for example, is not an obstacle to action. For me, that's, uh, that's very important. And then looking ahead, um, of course, the, um, the war in Ukraine has, has led to uh, major announcements of increased defense spending uh, across Europe. And I think how we deal with this increase in defense spending in relation to Europe's defense industrial and technological base, but also in overcoming longstanding issues of fragmentation of our forces, interoperability, etc. This will be one of the main challenges ahead for me. Yeah, it's been, it's widely said, and in fact it is the case, that while member states, well, most member states, spend a lot of money, or a good bit of money, uh, on, um, on their defence forces, 
that the lack of, of coordination means that we don't get as, as much value for money, if you like, as, as we might do. Yeah, I think, I think that's precisely the point. So we, we see that um, defense investment and spending is going up, but uh, too little is spent in a collaborative way. So we have, we have developed tools amongst ourselves to increase um, coordination of defense planning. We have a European Defense Fund that allows us to, uh, to research and develop together uh, next generation capabilities. We have the PESCO, the Permanent Structured Cooperation, which allows us to, uh, to work together and build uh, projects, either collaboration or um, in terms of developing capabilities. Um, so we have the tools at our disposal. We are increasingly looking also at joint procurement, for instance, and how we can uh, leverage that at EU level to get better outcomes for, uh, for lesser money. Um, and I think this is really the challenge ahead because the, the decisions, the investment decisions that are taken today, they have very strong lock-in effects. I mean, the defense equipment has a very long um, life. So whatever is bought today will be, um, uh, will be in stock for the, for the next 20, perhaps even 30 years. And we have to make sure that whatever we invest now will help resolve some of the issues we faced uh, in the past in terms of interoperability, for example. One other, um, come shortly to questions, um, one other um, you know, quite major development, I suppose, has been the, the operationalization, if you can call it that, of the European Peace Facility, um, which has been, um, which was first provided for in the, in, in, in the current EU financial framework, but has been really used a lot. Um, and there, the Commission, I know, is now looking to, to increase it further um, so maybe just briefly you might say, what, what does it actually do? Or what has, what has it done and is it doing in the context of Ukraine? And of course, bearing in mind that Ireland has been, while participating in it, has made clear that it does not wish to um, support the uh, acquisition of lethal uh, weapons. But in general terms, what does the EPF do? Yes, so the EPF is a new instrument, as you said, was only recently created um, and uh, operational as of 2021. And it's one of those tools that now, in the following Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, has, uh, has gotten great attention because we, at the time we were negotiating, nobody was expecting that this instrument would become so valuable in, what, in, our, in our current policy response. I think, first of all, it's important to note that it's an off-budget fund. It's financed by member states based on the GNI key. And this is because the treaty, of course, prohibits uh, the EU budget being used for um, spending directly related uh, to military and defense uh, implications. Uh, the European Peace Facility has two pillars. The first pillar covers the common cost of our mission and operations. This is the former Altia mechanism. Uh, so, for instance, if a new military operation is launched, headquarters need to be set up, then the EPF can cover the uh, incremental common cost for this. Um, there is also a part of deployment of troops, etc., that could be covered under this Pillar 1. And then Pillar 2, which is the one that has gotten the most attention, is assistance measures. The reason why we needed this fund was, uh, for, for example, to allow the European Union to do what we call train and equip missions, because we had training missions, but then uh, we were training soldiers or military uh, abroad, and we did not have the tools to actually also equip them. Um, meaning that this created a certain uh, disconnect or that our action was not complete. And under the assistance measures, um, which is a global instrument, the European Peace Facility is a global instrument, this allows us, amongst others, to also provide equipment, including legal, to, to, to third parties. Um, there is, of course, a large amount of um, human rights and other safeguards built into this EPF Council decision. Uh, as well as conflict-sensitive analysis and all of the underlying principles of, of EU action. Um, it started with an, a budget originally of 5 billion euros. It has already been topped up by 2 billion at the end of last year. Uh, another top-up is being discussed as we speak, uh, because out of these, uh, these available funds, uh, to date already 3.5 billion have been used in support of, of Ukraine um, in seven uh, consecutive packages of 500 million. And as you rightly pointed out, um, Rory, the, the EPF also provides for what we call constructive abstention, in particular in regards to lethal aid being provided to third countries. And this is where uh, Ireland, for instance, has consistently um, abstained. And then uh, the part uh, of its contribution has been directed exclusively to, to non-lethal means. So I think it's also a good um, illustration of how, how our tools take uh, the uh, the, the national points of view of all member states into account. Well, 
thank you very much. And now I think I'm going to move on to questions and a number of the other things I wanted to raise uh, I think are covered by the questions anyway. So can anyone wishing to make a contribution from the floor please put up um, their hand? Um, okay. I see a man in a short-sleeved white shirt over, over there. And just to remember everybody, maximum two minutes, which I will please quite, uh, quite, quite severely. Uh, Tom Crilly from the Peace and Neutrality Alliance. I like some of the comments coming from the speakers on the need for peace and cooperation. But then when you link it to NATO, I see a total contradiction. Your, your chairperson mentioned, and you all agreed more or less, that Ukraine has uh, changed everything. I feel the triple lock mechanism plays an important role in Irish neutrality. As government ministers repeat the narrative that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed everything. We have a new dictator, a new enemy. Our policies must change. We cannot let Russia, with their position on the UN Security Council, dictate our foreign policy as to where we send Irish troops. Following research by PANA, we found there is not a single instance of Russia or the USSR vetoing an Irish peacekeeping mission of the United Nations. Over the last number of years, 95% of res resolutions at the UN Security Council have been passed. And a permanent member has exercised a veto in only 5% of cases. Since, according to the Charter of the UN, the Security S Council... Sorry, excuse me. There is going to be a panel on the triple lock um, later on, I think. Yeah, well, um, we so, so maybe just, um, if you yeah. could just, um, yeah. if you've anything to ask about the CSDP specifically. Well, my point then, you raise the spectre of Russia has correct, correct, uh, committed many crimes, that's correct. But over the last 20 years, the US and their NATO allies, Britain and France and other EU countries, have devastated Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya. Total, Ill, totally illegal intervention wars. The Irish government still allows US warplanes refuel at Shannon Airport on their way to the mi their military bases in Germany, Poland and Saudi Arabia. We still allow NATO warplanes dock in Cork Harbour. My question to the panel, do you agree Irish neutrality should mean opposing the warmongering activities of both the United States and of Russia and that we must support all victims of imperialism and exploitation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to group um, a couple of questions in the interest of time. So, who else might have a question? Please. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. In, in, yeah. Um, Patricia McKenna. I'm a former MEP. Uh, I, one of the things I found missing from the presentation this morning, and I think it's a key issue because we're talking about security and defence policy, the European Union, is uh, the issue of the European Defence Agency. Now, I was in the European Parliament back in 2000, or 1994. I was a member of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Security and Disarmament, as it was called then. Interestingly, that subcommittee became the Subcommittee on Security and Defence so disarmament suddenly became defence. But I watched the growth of the European Defence Agency. It was originally called the European Armaments Agency. And in the Thessalonica summit, it was recognised by the European Union. Now, in the Nice Treaty, I think it's Article 40, uh, 42.3, uh, that agency... Now, as I said, t bearing in mind the agency grew from the European Armaments Agency, which was very worried about the fact that it wasn't making enough money on arms, the arms industries in Europe weren't making much money. So that was, that was the foundation of that European Defence Agency. It was incorporated into the Lisbon Treaty. And it's a key, a key component of the European security and defence policy. And it was given treaty status, but also an fundamental issue. It was given the role of assessing member states' capabilities and also recommend, recommending to the EU institutions in relation to uh, 
boosting the arms industry. Now, you know, it doesn't take a genius to work out that an industry that uh, has such a key role and it, it produces arms, it's not going to be saying, let's cut back on arms spending. So I, I, I think that's an issue that you have to, I would like to hear the panel on in relation to the dangers of that. It's the only industry in the European Union that's given this huge status in relation to pushing to make more money for that industry. And personally, I'm coming from the pacifist uh, perspective. I, I really do not think that this agency should have this key role and that where is the accountability in relation to that and in relation to pushing for more uh, arms industry business for the European Armaments Agent, uh, businesses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so two questions there, one quite specifically <laughs> about the European Defence Agency and one about the broader question of the EU relationship um, with the Western powers uh, and NATO. So maybe we'll kick off with NATO, um, the EU's relationship with NATO um, and the consequences of that for uh, CSDP, and maybe Ken, you might talk about that. Um, yeah, so I suppose they, there's, a, there's another one on the slide, I see, coming up around this about how, I suppose, me different member states view the division of labour between the EU um, and NATO when it comes to questions of, of security and defence. I think it's a, it's a real area that needs to be Ironed out, I suppose. I mean, there, there are member states who sort of very strongly see, see NATO as, as the only show in town when it comes to security and defence and therefore are less, less willing to, to engage with or, or develop separate um, you know, Euro European, European capabilities. I'm all struck and reminded by uh, Sven Biskop, who does a lot of work in, in, in this area, where he sort of despairs of this constant debate between NATO and the EU, given the huge overlap in members, that a, an increase in capacity for one is an increase for capacity um, in the other almost by, by default. Um, and really the reality is, and maybe this picks up a little bit on Patricia's point, um, th there is a question of capacity here. Um, there is a question of the ability of European mem member states to take action if and when they see that as something that, that, that's necessary. I can obviously recognise from a, a pacifist perspective that that would be troubling. Um, but it's worth remembering that these mechanisms are all driven by what member states identify as their needs and their priorities. So the, the, annual, the CAR, the Annual Review on Defence, is driven by a member state setting its own objectives and then figuring out what are the ways in which it can pool and share or cooperate with other partners in order to achieve those, those particular objectives. Um, just going back to the, the, the peacekeeping operations and not to step on the toes of the triple lock battle um, later. So there was a, a, an EU mission in 2003, I can't remember if it was a Proxima or Concordia, um, in what's now North Macedonia, was the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and I believe that's the only one that operated outside of UNSC mandate, um, and therefore Ireland wasn't able to contribute to that particular one, though it has contributed to... I think, I think it was a Chinese veto at the time, yeah. rela related to another issue, if you like, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Well, just on the question of different member states and the perspectives, France has always been particularly associated with the idea of a strong strategically autonomous European Union. President Macron said a few years ago that NATO was brain dead. Um, do you think he'd say the same today? Sorry. Would President Macron say that NATO was brain dead today, do you think? <laughs> um, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think that the, the French love-hate relationship with NATO is, is sort of well, well, well documented. But I, I think the recognition now, and this is part of that reality, reality check for the EU, um, uh, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has brought about, is that NATO remains sort of a, a, the key linchpin of, of security and defence in, in the region. Um, so I think France has recognised the need to continue engaging with, within NATO structures, also through the European Political Community Initiative, the idea of expanding beyond um, the EU membership, particularly with the, the United Kingdom. And I think the only tension there, or the only potential wrinkle in, in, in that context is while NATO for now is not brain dead, we do have an election coming up in the United States um, in, in, in the next 18 months that may change that calculation somewhat. So I think it's prudent to at least be aware of the possibility of operating in distinct and separate to NATO. Thank you. Steen, on the question of the European Defence Agency, which I think you did mention briefly in your earlier remarks, but in terms of you know, what Patricia McKenna um, has, has said about the the risks as she sees them. I mean, what can you, I mean, I don't want to ask you to intervene in domestic Irish uh, politics if you like, but 
what would you say to kind of reassure people, um, or not, about the European Defence Agency and its, its mission and, and purposes? Um, well, I think Ken made the most important point. The European Defence Agency is an intergovernmental agency. So whatever it does, it does so with the full consent and support of all of its member states. Um, it's also, I think, worth bearing in mind that the agency was created at the time when um, defence spending was not rising. Quite on the contrary, defence spending was, was uh, going down across Europe. What the agency tries to do is to stimulate cooperation between member states to make sure that they work together. Uh, because many of the capability development programs um, that, that we need across Europe, they are simply too large for an individual member state to tackle, even the largest one. Uh, e even France, I think, will find it difficult to develop on its own uh, next generation fighter airplanes, for instance. And of course, this, this argument is even, uh, uh, is even more valid for, for smaller member states. Um, so I think um, the agency is not about um, stimulating the defense industry per se. It's about stimulating cooperation between member states to make sure that they have a platform to exchange, to agree on joint norms, to agree on, uh, on standards, and then uh, if they wish to do so, to jointly uh, work towards uh, either procuring or, or developing them. Um, perhaps if you allow just a, just a short remark on the issue of, of UN and also in response to, to the gentleman's question. Um, I think it's, it's important to say that in many cases, the Security Council, it's enough for one of the members to implicitly threaten with a veto for a vote not to take place. So the, the, the formal numbers of vetoes outspoken is not the same as the amount of files where the UN was blocked or the Security Council was unable to, to take a decision. And I think Ireland was, uh, was in fact a non-permanent member of the Security Council when, uh, when the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine took place. And I think this is a very a good example. So I think going forward, this is really one of, one of the more um, uh, thorny issues for us to tackle with. How, as a European Union, with a very strong base in international law, a very strong insistence on, uh, on uh, international law being supportive of our external action, how to handle with situations where clearly international law is broken, but the Security Council is, for reasons X, Y, or Z, unable to act. I think it's a, we, we don't have the final answer to that, but it's one of the, uh, one of the difficult questions uh, to tackle. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for um, submitting questions through Slido. And I'm going to try as far as possible uh, to, well, A, to group questions, but B, to cover things which maybe haven't been covered in our discussion so far. A number of the most popular questions, I think, um, have, been, um, have been answered um, already or, or, or discussed. Um, so, just w one is the, the very top question, um, which is, does the EU, from Alan Deering, um, does the EU have a plan in case of a civil war or breakup of the Russian uh, Federation, including for um, displaced persons, uh, exceeding the number from Ukraine? That, that's one question, I think, which is, um, which is important. Um, a second question from... Adele, um, I'm breaking my rule, even though she didn't give her surname, I'll, I'll take her question. Do panelists have any concerns that larger member states may frame economic interests as national security concerns? And I suppose that's relevant to the armaments industry as well. And then a question from um, Tobias uh, Winwright of St. Patrick's Pontifical University. Um, he says, of course, that there are different policing cultures in different member states. Uh, Irish Guardi are usually unarmed, uh, whereas other nations are more, what he says here, militaristic. Um, are there tensions? So maybe we might answer that question first and then go back to the other pair. Absolutely. Uh, we, we talk a lot in, in um, our missions about EU standards, but of course we find quite quickly when we bring a lot of people together from different member states, what, what are the standards we're talking about? And when it comes to policing, and there's other um, panel members later on as well, uh, who have a similar background to myself. Uh, yes, there are uh, different um, ways of working, different approaches, but the idea of uh, bringing people together uh, under, again, I'm only referring to civilian missions, under civilian CSDP missions, is that we develop within that um, our, our approach, and we work then with the um, host country authorities, whatever country we're working in, 
uh, under the international principles and standards. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the opportunity uh, because we've talked about capabilities, we've talked about the EU uh, coming together, using all different instruments um, to work in the area of common security and defence, um, to mention the civilian compact. And this is something which has been developed. Um, it, it already started a few years ago. The first civilian compact was in 2018, and the latest one was launched just a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, by the High Representative Burrell. And basically what this is, it is to, to make sure that the EU and the member states can deal with the, the myriad of challenges and problems um, on the global level in relation to security by becoming more effective, more flexible, more adaptable, and the civilian missions uh, to ensure that we have the, the right capabilities, the right uh, competences, the right skills, um, and the support, of course, uh, from, from the member states when we go into a country, and local ownership. This is hugely important uh, that we have, we go into countries where we're invited, and we have to make sure that we work with the local authorities, local civil society, um, to develop in the areas, whether it's monitoring, whether it's uh, security sector reform, uh, whatever it happens to be. And this, coming back to the, the question about the police, um, the Angarda Shikana, uh, I mean, I've been seconded by the Department of Foreign Affairs since 2012, but prior to that, um, I was seconded on a couple of missions by Angarda Shikana, and we provide a lot of uh, uh, expertise, even though we're not armed, it doesn't matter, most <coughs> civilian missions are, are non-executive anyway, and unarmed missions, um, but we, we provide, expertise and support in Ukraine at the moment, investigation of international crimes, of war crimes, mm -hmm. um, advisory functions, monitoring in Georgia, public oversight, uh, experience from, from this type, community policing. There's, there's a, a wide range uh, where, where we can contribute uh, to these missions. I mean, I suppose a basic issue for civilian missions is that while you know, taking part in international missions is a core part of a, a soldier's job, that in many cases the EU is looking for people who are often quite of considerable value and use at home. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, across all the member states. I mean, it's one of the challenges we do face, as I mentioned, to make sure that we have the, the people, the right people, and the right uh, skills and expertise. Um, working in a mission abroad as you mentioned for the military it's quite clear it's part of the the framework um but for civilians for for police it's a little bit different and the benefits that uh, we can bring from here from our side but also that uh, people can attain from working in these areas and environments um working with other eu member states as well of course and building up the expertise there um, but also from the local environments that they work in, the host countries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Steen, I'm going to throw you the easy question about um, your plans in case of a civil war or breakup of the <laughs> Russian Federation. Um, a more topical question today, maybe, than it would have been on Friday. I'm, I'm afraid I can only say that I'm not aware of any planning happening uh, on, <laughs> on that front. But uh, at the same time, if you look at our response to the war in Ukraine, because the question specifically specifically mentions the, the number of refugees coming in. Um, I think we have proven uh, now in, in the last year and a half that if a crisis situation occurs, we are able to, to react very quickly. And I'm sure national capitals are following very, very closely what's happening in, in Moscow. Thank you. I think that's probably the best anyone could do at yeah. this point. Um, and then, Ken, I mean, this question of from Adele about the, the danger of, of big member states using CSDP, if you like, as a kind of vehicle for their economic interests. That's a charge which is quite often made about the US especially, but I suppose with the European states too. Um, well, there was an old joke about CSDP being what France could convince the other member states to go along with uh, as being a, a working definition. But, but the reality is it's, it's very much an intergovernmental process, um, and particularly at the EU level, the development of the EAS over the last sort of 10 to 15 years as well. Um, the work that went into uh, creating the strategic compass as well and the, a common threat assessment. So there, there's a lot of work going on within the European Union to, to get member states to, to coordinate their view of what the challenges are. So it's very unlikely 
that an individual member state would be able to disguise an interest in, in, in that particular way. It's not a concern I would have in relation to potential CSDP missions or other civilian or military initiatives. Thank you. Okay, looking at some more Slido questions, um, I'll say quite a number of them have been covered one way or another. There's a question from Michael McLaughlin, and it's actually suggesting that CSDP, now I know you've kind of answered this in regard to Ukraine, but if you look at, as he says, Sudan, Afghanistan, you know, has the EU at times been very slow to react to, to crises? Um, related question, um, Scott Fitzsimons, um, well, it's about missions. To what extent do EU member states exercise any kind of control over their contingents uh, in EU missions, whether civilian or, or, or military? Um, and, then a, and then a question from uh, Charlie Flanagan, TD. Um, of course, the e you talked about the EU, NATO, um, and, uh, and the UN. There's also the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which he describes as discredited. Um, just what support about that, that particular relationship? So three rather diverse questions there. Um, I, I, I might jump in just on, on, on the reaction. I thought that, that question for, for Michael McLaughlin um, in terms of response. I think what both the Afghanistan and Sudan situation showed us was that need to develop capacity, that it, it highlighted certain gaps. I mean, I think in the Irish case, in, in relation to Afghanistan, we were relying on the French and the Finns to help us evacuate uh, civilian personnel. Going back to the, the triple lock in relation to Sudan, we're constrained with deploying only 12 military personnel to, to engage in those kind of missions, so that's something we probably need, need to consider. So I do think they highlighted that while this was something that operated at the member state level, because it was about you know member states extracting their nationals, um, the CSTP, particularly through the EDA and, and PESCO and those, th those initiatives, does provide pathways for states to develop capabilities um, to, to, to respond. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, any response to that point? I say mea culpa. <laughs> I, okay. I, I won't contradict me on Martin or Claire. Okay. Thank you. Um, then, Steen, about this uh, this this question um, of the OSCE. What is the re well? In fact, maybe I'll go to Maura because you've actually served with the OSCE. Um, and it's, I mean, again, very briefly, without getting into technicalities, what would you say the relationship is there? And is it, well, better not ask you as a serving official, is it discredited? But what is the relationship? Um, between, with CSDP, I mean, the, yeah. the um, I mean, we, we work very closely with the UN, with the OSCE, um, and other agencies, IOM, et cetera. Um, in Ukraine, obviously, the OSCE had to, had to leave and are no longer there, although there are some projects now, mm -hmm. and we work uh, with them on that. I mean, we want to avoid duplication. We want to be effective and, and come together. Um, I think it's, it's important to have a forum where uh, all actors can come together and, and speak, and there's some dialogue going on. So I think from that point of view, um, it serves the, the purpose. But yeah. And then, Steen, the, the question about member state control or influence over their own national contributions to whether it's missions or, or battle groups? Um, perhaps just a, a very brief point to say Maybe that... just speak up a little. <clears throat> uh, a brief point to say that in relation to, to the previous question, um, I did speak briefly about the rapid deployment capacity yeah. that we uh, that member states have committed to to develop together by 2025. One of its stated ambitions is to be able to perform rescue and evacuation missions. And, and that's uh, the idea behind this of, is, of course, to give member states the tools, should they wish to do so, to perform a mission such as was recently required in, in, in Sudan. Um, then on, uh, on the other point, uh, it's important, I think, to stress that um, missions and operations on the EU side, um, they do not work with mandatory 
contributions. So there is typically fourth generation conferences uh, where member states on a voluntary basis uh, contribute to those missions. Of course, they do so in the full knowledge of the mandate of the mission as it has been agreed unanimously. Um, and then, of course, member states are free to decide themselves um, how long that they will provide these contingent, and in some cases they are even free to add what is called national caveats, yeah. so saying that their, this specific contribution from this country cannot be used to perform these tasks which have been identified in the mandate. So it's not an operational control, but it's a, it's a control of definitions, yeah. yeah. We have, <coughs> in principle we have six minutes left. Um, is, may I ask, does anyone know if the Taoiseach is, is here or, no, okay. So we'll, we've little more we've little more time then than I than I thought. Okay, well let's go back to the the floor uh, and see if there are questions. Um, I see a, a woman in black um, there waving her hand at me. So please, um, and just if you say who you are, and then I think a microphone will come to you. Hi, uh, my name is Sinead McMahon, and I just completed a BSc in Government and Political Science at UCC, and I'm a Quirkus University Scholar. Um, my question is, to what extent can there be citizen participation in foreign policy decisions, particularly in relation to the CSDP? And in the EU, we see a tension between intergovernmentalism and supranationalism, and it's all kind of very interesting and relevant to how best are citizens' interests um, represented in the EU in relation to foreign security policy. And was this an issue for discussion at the Conference on the Future of Europe? Um, which included citizens and was um, an assembly of citizens across the EU. And, uh, yeah, again, I think it's very relevant to a lot of the discussions that have been happening. Um, to what extent can citizens participate in foreign policy decisions, um, uh, in, especially in relation to the CSDP? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see a, a hand down. I see a hand down there. I don't know who it belongs to, but uh, mm. there it is. Yes, please. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Carol Fox. I'm involved with the Peace and Neutrality Alliance and Swords to Plowshares. Um, a, few, a few quick points. First of all, I want to congratulate the European Union on properly naming the EU battle groups, which they failed to do, of course, when naming the European Peace Facility, with its billions of euro being spent on military activities. Um, I'm interested that you're saying that there's not any obligations between NATO and the European Union. In January, as you know, the EU and NATO signed a cooperation agreement. And in that, the Financial Times headline was stronger European armies are to support US-led alliance, not offer an alternative to it. And part of that declaration that they signed said that European defense, more capable European defense, that can, will contribute positively to global and transatlantic security and is complementary to and interoperable with NATO. So I would like to just ask more about that particular thing. And finally, um, this new European Rapid Reaction Force has been mentioned. Ireland was one of the 14 initiators of that. You said the EU battle groups didn't really get off the ground to do any battling because there is a unanimity principle. I'm wondering, with the new 5,000 strong European Rapid Reaction Force with air, land, and maritime facilities, which is being advertised as going abroad on missions, will there be a move now to try to switch from unanimity to qualified majority voting because there has been noted that that is being discussed in common foreign security policy, and I see that Michal Martin himself has come out saying that Ireland is willing to have a look at that. So Thank if you could just comment on the NATO links and what this new rapid reaction force might be getting up to. Thank, Thank you. Th Thank you, Ms. Fox. Um, and then I'll take one other um, chap with a beard, three rows back. Thank you very much to all the panelists. My name is Dr. Paul Quinn. I'm uh, the Global Head of Peacebuilding and Conflict Prevention for an international NGO called Christian Aid, working in 27 countries. 
And I was just wondering if the, co if the panel could maybe comment on a number of the very strong reservations that European-wide civil society organizations had around the European peace facility, particularly around the potential for human rights violations and the export of weapons of lethal force to third-party um, armed forces or third-party state governments, I should say. Um, and also around the accountability gap that may exist as an off-budget mechanism, um, particularly around EU parliamentary oversight. And then maybe just as an addition to that, around the growing disconnect maybe between the EU defence and military expenditure versus expenditure around conflict prevention and peace building, other foundations of the EU, um, which now represents, I think, 12% of ODA, excuse me, um, less than 1% of the economic costs of conflict. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if, if, I, if, if I may just, to, I mean, and that links in a bit with the, the first question from um, Sinead, am I right? Um, about citizen involvement um, in discussion about foreign policy and, and CSDP. It's a bigger question, I know, um, but it's, it links into the question. So, okay. Um, just, so if I maybe ask you about that, um, Ken, I mean, there has been the Conference of the Future of Europe and so on, but mm. to what extent is it possible to bring citizens into, into, in, in, into the discussion? Um, I, I feel I have to draw attention to what we're doing here, <laughs> which is, you know, consulting the forum, and it's, it's a welcome step in, in, in that direction. Um, it's obviously a challenge because, you know, foreign, foreign policy is often a something that's reactive. It's reacting to external crises, decisions are made in, in short time. So in many ways, we're relying on institutional design to ensure that citizens um, are, are, are consulted. Um, and we do see that you know, primarily, I suppose, for the EU level, it's the intergovernmental nature of that, that you know, national governments are, are representing their citizens, representing their interests in that context. And if citizens are unhappy with that, they have the opportunity to, to turf them out um, at, you know, the, at the next time they have an election. So, so I just, the Taoiseach is here and we're just at 10 o'clock, so maybe a last word from the two of you. I just wanted to add to that that the, the uh, mission members who are participating in missions are also EU citizens, uh, those who are seconded. So it's, it's also a way of seeing what's happening on the ground and coming back and feeding into the discussions like this. Thank you, Roger. And last word to you. Well, on the strategic compass, to please just, just to yeah. point out that uh, for the strategic compass, we followed a, a two-year process, including what we call a strategic dialogue, which was really about opening the windows and the doors to also interact through NGOs, through think tanks, but also with the, with the larger public. And then, of course, indirectly to the European Parliament, but also whenever new initiatives are launched, such as the EU maritime security strategy, there was a public consultation phase uh, preceding that. So I think uh, that is the indirect answer to the question on citizens' participation. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, sorry, we have to keep the time. And you've had a, and you've had a, sorry, okay, very briefly. Well, I suppose the Taoiseach will know that governments, governments, governments can change after elections, I suppose. Uh, anyway, just to, to finish off then, very, very grateful to our, our panel. I, I hope you'll feel that we've had a good beginning to today's discussions. I'm um, grateful to all who posed questions. Very sorry we can't get through all of them or even answer in more detail, <coughs> in more detail a couple of the points raised in the last round. So to Kenneth McDonough, Stan Miles, and Maura O'Sullivan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much to that panel and just as a reminder we'll be coming back after the break to another session on uh, European common defence and security policy. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce Am Pishak, who's going to um, address the, the, the forum in a moment. Uh, he of course needs no introduction, he's been uh, TD since 2007, uh, leader of Fine Gael since 2017, has served as Minister for Social Protection, for Wealth, for Tourism. Uh, transport and sport, and of course has been, was Taoiseach 
2017 to 2020, and again since last December. And again, on, on behalf of all of us uh, working on the forum, we're absolutely delighted that the Fisic is here to offer his reflections today. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, sir. I think, I think I'll, address, I'll, address, I'll answer those questions in the course of my remarks, if I'm allowed to, allowed to speak. Many, many, of those, many of those things are untrue. Others are conspiracy theories, but I'll be happy to cover them uh, in the, in, 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 during my speech if I'm given the chance to speak. Uh, so thank you, everyone, uh, chairperson, colleagues and friends. We're living today in an age of crisis. We have war in Europe, and a modern imperialist power has invaded its neighbour and the international community. An age of hybrid threats where disinformation, terrorism, espionage, cyber attacks and economic coercion are used to attack states and undermine public trust. I believe we must face up to these security threats and we cannot face them alone. We need allies and we need friends. And above all, we need allies that broadly share our values, democracy, free speech, free enterprise, individual rights and equality before the law. It's a guest that should form show, not kincha a yen of ganyanter play, er in policy slan dalid er nashunta er balach oskulta. Tochonker aga, tochonker aga er in galer agus ni more doing kinu a dain of lakela. My thanks at the outset to the Tanishta for taking this initiative and for convening this forum. My thanks also to Louise Richardson for chairing the forum and for bringing her extensive international experience to the issues being discussed. And my thanks also to the moderators, the contributors, and everyone taking part for making sure this has been a rigorous, informed, and informative exploration of present-day challenges and future opportunities. On this, the third day of discussions, we can see that there isn't a perceived outcome. This isn't about NATO membership or changing our long-standing policy of military neutrality. Not being a NATO member makes it harder to defend ourselves in the unlikely event of an attack, and that is just a fact. Whether it makes us more or less vulnerable to attack is, of course, debatable. But I do believe it does help in some ways. It certainly helps in terms of our, our relationship with the Global South, many of whom are suspicious of NATO, as among its leading members are former colonial powers. And I think it was helpful in our successful bid for a siege on the UN Security Council in 2020 during my first term as Taoiseach. It's difficult to know whether we have, would have won that election or not uh, had we been a member, but it certainly was a factor. Similarly, in my conversations with prime ministers and presidents from countries of the global south, when I asked them to support Ukraine, uh, it is useful for us to be able to say that we are a non-NATO member and we are on the side of Ukraine because we see this as an imperial attack an imperialist attack on that country. 
colleagues today is about stimulating an open, inclusive and well-informed conversation on foreign security and defence policy choices before us. We face sustainable development challenges, including widespread global hunger and food insecurity, and the devastating impacts of climate change. In large parts of the world, democracy is in retreat, and undemocratic states are spreading their influence. We face revolutionary changes in technology that will affect the manner in which we live in ways we cannot yet imagine. Technological changes that might themselves create new security threats. We face an increasing range of malign actors, including other states who could and would, if allowed to, do us harm. This consultative forum is making a statement that we're prepared to face these challenges. Today in Ukraine, we see military aggression and force disrupting the rules-based international order and shredding our shared respect for independent sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. We haven't stayed silent on this because to do so would have been a betrayal of our history and every principle that guides us as a nation. We also have responsibilities to ourselves as a sovereign nation, to our European and international partners, and to international law itself, and we will meet these responsibilities. Since the foundation of our state, we've been committed advocates of the rules-based international order. And over so many decades, we've been a committed advocate for the United Nations and what it represents, despite its many limitations. The rules-based international order is often under threat, and it's under threat again, and that has implications for all of us. Our discussions here are taking place against the backdrop of an international system that has been unable to work as it should to prevent conflict and aggression, to protect human rights, and to bring peace with justice, especially in the global south. Last year, as we all know, Ireland marked the centenary of our independence. Since securing our place among the nations, we've always stood up for multilateralism, for the rule of law, for the principle of equality among states, as well as the understanding that all people everywhere have the right to live in freedom with dignity. We were members of people that we had to struggle to gain control of our own freedom and destiny. So we've consistently stood for the core principles of respecting independence, sovereignty, and the territorial integrity of other states, and will continue to do so. The government has said, just as other governments have said, that we are militarily neutral, but we are not politically neutral. We assisted the Allies in the Second World War against Nazi Germany and fascism. We joined the EEC during the Cold War and rejoiced when the Berlin Wall fell and communism was defeated in Europe. Enlargement of the European Union was strongly supported by Ireland and we voted in a referendum for structured European defence and security cooperation, or PESCO. Our ODA budget is now more than a billion euros a year and we've served in countless UN peacekeeping missions a role of which we are extremely proud of, and particularly the role that our defence forces, our Gardaí and others have played in that. And we have dramatically expanded our network of embassies and offices around the world. We have a very active and independent foreign policy. It's also why we denounced from the very beginning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There are no two sides to this. Russia is the aggressor, and Ukrainians are right to defend themselves and deserve our help. Today, Ireland is an advanced digital and open economy. Our global connectivity, in which we play host to many leading technological companies, is essential in our economic success and our future prosperity. That very connectivity and how centrally we all depend on it is represented in almost every aspect of our daily lives. It is a relatively recent development it creates great strength, but is also a potential vulnerability. A few of us need to be reminded of the cyber attack carried out against the HSC back in May 2021. The ransomware attack by a criminal organization based in Russia laid bare the real world impact that the malicious use of technology can bring. It was a reminder that Ireland's geography, which in the past protected us, doesn't insulate us from the challenges of global conflict as it did in the past. 
In fact, in some respects today, our geography makes us more vulnerable. We occupy a strategic position on the Atlantic seaboard, on the Western approach to Europe. And as an island nation, we face particular challenges. Connectivity is about more than digital space. There's dependence on others for energy. And as we've seen in recent years, energy can be mo mobilized as a tool of conflict. And we've seen this particularly in the way Russia has weaponized energy as part of its war against Ukraine. It's particularly why the transition to home-based renewables is needed for security reasons, as well as economic and environmental sustainability. The same is true with interconnection with mainland Europe and the United Kingdom. As we increasingly live digital lives, it's easy to forget that the degree to which we still rely on physical cables to create the networks that bring people together all around the world. A significant proportion of the most important transatlantic cables run close to our coast, either through our territorial waters or our wider exclusive economic zone. The size of our economic, exclusive economic zone, almost half a million square kilometres, shows the scale of the challenge this represents. Seas seven times greater than our land mass and airspace as well. Today, our security and economic well-being is being tested in new, in new and more challenging ways. So we need to explore the opportunities for cooperating more closely with partners, while at the same time building our own capabilities to defend and secure our own state. As part of the, the response, we're working hard to improve the capabilities of our defence forces. We've committed to multi-annual funding increases and spending increased by 70 million euros alone last year. We currently have funding for a complement of 9,500 members of our defence forces, and we intend to increase that number by a further 2,000. We, of course, do not underestimate the challenge in achieving this objective, particularly at a time of full employment and enormous economic opportunity. But we are working very hard to improve recruitment and retention. Pay is already very competitive by international standards, but there are, of course, other issues to deal with. But irrespective of how much we develop our own autonomous capabilities, a small country of only 5 million people can only defend itself to a certain extent. Our international partners, bilateral and multilateral, are essential to our security, and we need to continue to invest and build those relationships. Ireland needs functioning multilateral global institutions. We also need the deep connections with our partners in the European Union and we're not alone in reflecting on those issues. Russia's invasion of a non-aligned neutral country, neither a member of the EU nor NATO, has led many European states to reevaluate their own security and defense policies and to work more closely together. While NATO is seen by most European partners as the fundament of their collective security, the EU itself has played a central role in helping Ukraine to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity, providing humanitarian assistance, financial aid, military aid, including the non-lethal assistance to which Ireland has contributed. In welcoming the millions of Ukrainians who have sought refuge in the EU, we've also helped to Ukraine to defend itself. In imposing sanctions on the individuals and entities that assist Putin, we're making it more difficult for him to wage war. In refusing to stay silent on the world stage about this invasion, we're showing solidarity with those who are suffering the most and honoring our own difficult history. The EU's common security and defense policy is part of our security and defense policy. We help design it and shape it, and we stand by it because it upholds our values and principles as a country. We're proud of the role of we, in the role we play, and I'm proud to have made Ireland a founder member of PESCO during my first term as Taoiseach. We have long been a contributor to EU military and civilian crisis management missions. As we speak, the naval, surfa naval service vessel, the LE William Butler Yates, is deployed in the Mediterranean to prevent arms trafficking to Libya under the EU's uh, Operation Irene. Defence Forces personnel are also serving in challenging missions in both Bosnia-Herzegovina and Mali. Irish men and women are serving in EU civilian crisis management missions. 
in Georgia, Iraq, Kosovo, Ukraine, Somalia, Libya, Palestine and Niger. They're advising on policing and security, border management, judicial reform, human rights and gender policies, cyber security and hybrid threats. Some of our civilian CSDP deployees are here with us today and I want to pay tribute to them as well as the, the Defence Forces personnel and members of the Garda Síochána all around the world for their service. As a country, we also helped to design the new European Peace Facility, which allows for the strengthening of military and defence capacities of partners and bolsters the military aspects of peace operations, notably those carried out by the African Union and other regional organisations. The facility has come into its own for Ukraine, allowing the EU to provide direct military assistance to that country. Today, Ukraine exercises its right to self-defence in line with international law and the provisions of the UN Charter. To date, we've contributed over 130 million euros to Ukraine under the EPF. In our case, it is limited to the provision of non-lethal equipment and assistance, but that is extremely important in their defence. We've also participated with EU partners in PESCO projects relating to cyber threats, disaster relief cap capability, special, oper special operations forces medical training, systems for mine countermeasures, and maritime surveillance. In each case, analysis and reflection shows that participation provides significant benefits to our defence forces, helping them to carry out their roles at home, as well as making the best possible contribution to international crisis management operations and peacekeeping. I know that later today, the forum is going to hear from experts and practitioners from European partners, in particular Finland, a new NATO member and EU state, Norway, a NATO founder member, but not an EU state, Sweden, a NATO applicant and EU member, and Switzerland, which is non-NATO and non-EU. Each of these different countries plays a strong and principled role in conflict resolution and peace building, informed by their historical and different experiences that guide their approach to security and defence in the same way that our experience and history guides ours. Today's meeting of the Forum is an opportunity to hear from representatives and experts from these countries and to explore the ways in which a variety of other states have responded to the challenging security context of today. I believe that only by allowing a free flow of information and ideas can we make the right choices from the full range of options and opportunities available. Before I finish, I want to conclude with a few thoughts about our flag. Designed by Thomas Francis Marr as a symbol of peace and reconciliation, it has represented the ideals of our nation for 175 years. During the worst days of the Troubles, some of this country became uncomfortable with the tricolour because of the way it was being used by a small, violent and undemocratic minority who claimed it as their banner. However, they failed to defile it and it remained our own. In recent years, others have tried to use our flag, especially on social media and at protests, the tricolour once again being weaponised by a small minority, being used as a badge of identification and as a way of excluding others. Our flag, like our foreign policy, does not belong to any one section of Irish society. It belongs to all of us. It carries our values and aspirations, our hopes and dreams. It represents the very best of us as a nation. Our flag deserves better. And our people who believe in fairness and justice and kindness, in honouring our own history of suffering, deserve better than that as well. So my thanks to each of you in the audience and online for participating. I encourage everyone, expert, lay people, to get involved in what is an important discussion about our shared future and our long-term safety. Thank you very much, and I hope the rest of the day goes very well. Thank you very much indeed, Taoiseach, and thank you to those in the audience who permitted him to give his speech on encumbered. Um, we're now going to take a short break. I'd invite you to be back in your seats at 10.40. The next panel will begin.
promptly at 10.45. Thank you.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to start the next session, so could I ask everybody outside to come in and for everybody in the room to please take their seats, so we'll start. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Hi, morning everyone. Um, my name is Naomi O'Leary. I'm the moderator for this panel. Um, the theme of it is working with partners, Ireland's role in the EU common security and defense policy, or is it sometimes referred to in shorthand CSDP? I'm really keen to dig into some of the details of what Ireland actually does um, in EU common defense, and we're lucky to have a good panel here that will help us to understand that. Uh, we've got Coach Moran. He, she's a very experienced diplomat. She's served everywhere from South Africa to Vietnam to the United Nations. And now her job is she's Ireland's representative in the room where the 27 EU member states discuss and decide common EU defence policy. So she has that in-the-room perspective, which I'm really interested to bring out and to get your questions on as well. So welcome to Coach. We also have Martin Harrington. Um, Martin is Senior Strategic Advisor in the EU Advisory Mission Iraq. So this is one of the civilian missions, EU joint missions, that Ireland takes part in. Uh, in this one, it's based in Baghdad, and we can talk to him about what it's like on the ground, what's the rationale for Ireland taking part in missions like that, what does it actually involve. And we also have Professor John O'Brennan. Uh, he's Director and Professor at the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. And he has a background of research, particularly in enlargement, um, EU enlargement. He's been studying the development of EU's institutions over time, and he can tell us about what direction they might be moving in. And we also have Martin Butcher. Um, Martin Butcher is policy advisor on arms and conflict at Oxfam International. So essentially what he tries to do is he st tries to stop the proliferation of arms, try to reduce the amount of arms that are existing in the world, and most recently to try and bring an end to the Syrian civil war. So thank you so much to all of our panelists to be agreeing to take part today. I'll just give a brief introduction of the topic um, and some of the rules of the road. So um, just to remind everybody, as part of your attendance today, um, we've all agreed to guiding principles, um, and this is that the forum will part, uh, operate in a spirit of openness, Inclusing, uh, inclusive consultation and that personal attacks or personalized criticism aren't acceptable. Interventions should be briefed and focused on the topic that's discussed. Um, so I'm going to keep everybody to two minutes if, if that's okay because I do want to get in as many questions from you guys as possible because it's, it's rare to have a lineup of people like this sort of ready to take public questions. Um, so it's, I think it's a really good opportunity for everybody to, to, to discuss this stuff. Um, so as I said, we'll talk about what does Ireland actually do in EU common defence? How has Ireland contributed to shaping it? How has it decided which missions that we take part in? Um, and how does that express our position of traditional neutrality? How might it evolve in the future? We heard from Stein Malls on the previous panel from the EASS that he said it's not about building an EU army. It's rather about national armies that choose to work together a bit like under the United Nations. And there's three categories, I would say, where we can, we can point to what Ireland is doing. There's these joint missions, of which uh, Martin works in one. Some of them are civilian, some of them are military. We heard the Taoiseach referred to 
Operation Irini, the naval um, mission where they try to stop the trafficking of arms into Libya to en enforce uh, an international arms embargo. There's, these missions are going on all over the place. We have Irish staff in Bosnia and Herzegovina trying to keep the peace in the wake of the Balkan Wars. Um, they're in Niger. They're really all over the place. And we have a number of PESCO projects, including on maritime surveillance and on cooperation in cyber defense. And in the European P Peace Facility, Ireland has um, a kind of a, an unusual role for EU member states. Ireland actually contributed to the creation of something called constructive abstention, which means that, means that we only um, pay for non-lethal aid under the, to, for Ukraine, things like medical kits and helmets. Um, the way that the European Peace Facility works, it's now reached about 10 billion euro in size, so that all the different EU member states buy stuff for Ukraine, and then they basically send the invoice to Brussels, and they get reimbursed from this common fund. So Ireland chooses just to buy stuff like medical kits and helmets and so on. Um, so let's start our discussion. Um, I guess what I'm really interested to hear first and foremost is from Martin Harrington. He's come here from Baghdad. So I'm fascinated to hear a bit more about what it's like on the ground in one of these missions. Can I ask you first and foremost, Martin, are you welcome in Iraq? Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, um, are we welcome in Iraq? Uh, we're there by the invitation at the request of the Iraqi government, so um, I would... Do speak into the microphone. Yeah, Yeah, I would say we, we are welcome from that point of view. Uh, we have good engagement from the Iraqi government and our Iraqi counterparts. Um, there are over 40 Iraqi nationals that, that work in, with us in the EUAM Iraq mission. Um, so they're, they're quite a good indication of what the the feeling is like around Baghdad and around the country as to uh, the political situation and what's happening and giving us a bit of insight. So we know from our interaction with them and from interactions I would have in general if we, if we go out to uh, the ministries or engage in public, some public engagements that we do that um, the Iraqis are a very resilient people considering what they've gone through, what they're still gone, going through and, and what they're facing into the future. <coughs> And any assistance that they can get to improve their quality of life, improve their country, make the transition from the totalitarian regime that existed there prior to 2003 and what they've suffered since 2003, because they have. So we are welcome. Uh, it wouldn't be correct to say we're 100% welcome. If we were, we wouldn't be travelling in armoured cars around Baghdad in body armour. We wouldn't be living in a, a compound where the only um, access you have is, is around the building to, uh, for your exercises. The, the lads call it the hamster wheel. This is what became famously known as that's the only exercise you get. But that's, that's the nature of, of mission life. That's what you expect. That's what the Defence Forces have had. That's what other guards that have gone out to missions have had. Our mandate is to advise the uh, Iraqi government, and in particular we engage with the Ministry of the Interior and we engage with the Office of the National Security Advisor. And that advi advice is around um, civilian security sector reform. And there are a number of advisors in the mission. They advise on organised crime. They advise on border management. They advise on, on institutional reform, uh, counter-terrorism, uh, gender, human rights. So all that experience is brought together from, uh, from across Europe. They are serving police officers. They are retired police officers. They are from the civilian expert sector. They're academics. Uh, and they come together, and, and the, the team works very well uh, because you don't, you don't um, focus solely on your um, expertise. You mix it up. So with regards to... I was in Basra last week with the equality advisor uh, doing a presentation on equality and the integration of women into the Iraqi police force. Uh, which was interesting. Um, then you would be involved in human rights and attending workshops in, that, in relation to critical decision-making and how human rights are integrated into police operation. So all that goes into providing them with advice on, on where they need to, to, their strategy needs to go. Now, the problem with strategy and what we found in Iraq is that um, the instability in the government over a number of years, there's plenty of strategy, but there is very little implementation. And really, a strategic document then just sits on a shelf. If you're not implementing it, it's not worth the papers written on. So since last October, 
there is a new government, a permanent government, in place since the October 21 elections. So it took about it took a year, more or less, to elect a prime minister. There was some uh, controversy over that. We had um, the Sunni-Shia mix in Iraq, and in particular the Shia are the dominant uh, religion there. Uh, and no difference to ours, and I usually use this comparison 100 years ago when we got our independence, then we couldn't agree. Same thing is happening in Iraq. Uh, the Shias um, are the dominant parliamentarians, and they're not agreeing. And you have two distinct groups. You have a group that are called the Shia Coordination Framework, and they're a group that are under an umbrella because they came together to oppose uh, the Sadrist party, who are led by a Muslim cleric called Muqtada al-Sadr. And they're very much in, in conflict with each other as to how Iraq should be governed, to the point where Muqtada al-Sadr, in a mass resignation, in a mass resignation took his 73 MPs out of the parliament last year in protest at the nomination of Mohammed al-Sadani as the prime minister because he was pro-Iranian and he was Iranian-backed. Um, that continued up until the point last August where when al-Sudani was on the verge of being elected, uh, a mass protest was organised on the August Bank holiday weekend in Baghdad. And that's the first time that the Green Zone was breached in the 20 years that the coalition forces have been in Baghdad. And it was policed as a peaceful protest, which was a credit to the Iraqi security services. Uh, the Green Zone was breached, the Iraqi parliament was occupied, and it was occupied for four weeks before Muqtada al-Sadr announced on Twitter that he was resigning from politics. And our building is beside the Iraqi parliament. And when the tweet came out that he was resigning from politics, it initiated a conflict between his supporters outside the parliament and opposing groups that were outside the Green Zone. And both the Iraqi parliament, the prime minister's residence beside it, our building, uh, came under 24 hours of sustained attack from uh, mortar, automatic gunfire, uh, RPG. Um, for a solid 24 hours, that, that took place. 24 hours to the minute, he tweeted again that this is not what he wanted, that he didn't want Iraqi bloodshed, and he was demanding that his supporters leave the Green Zone within 60 minutes. And in 30 minutes, the Green Zone was cleared. They had gathered everything they had left. There was a traffic jam getting out of the Green Zone. And that was an indication from Muqtada al-Sadr to the government, here's how quickly I can start something, and here's how quickly I can stop it. And that's the level of influence he has. So since October the 21st, the government has been in place. He's on the sideline watching how they're performing, and he's told them that. And they really have hit the ground running as regards reform and what they intend doing. And at the heart of that is the EU mission because the Iraqis have told us that we are their main partner in initiating this, this security sector reform. So that's where we stand at the moment, and that's the road that's ahead of us. So just to check I understood properly, the Iraqi government invited this EU mission. It was in 2017, I think? In 2017, yeah. And the purpose of what you're doing there is to, to try to uh, help Iraq become a country where peace and security and order is maintained by civilian forces like police, rather than by military, right? Yeah. And it's to help com like secure, have secure borders, combat corruption and things like that. Is, is that right? Yeah, 2017 the mission began. Um, obviously, initially they were trying to make their, um, create relationships within the Ministry of Interior, within the Office of the National Security Advisor. COVID hit, and COVID, as we know, stopped everything for a good two years. Um, like you were saying, the object of the mission is to I would say assist in the transition from green to blue, from where they've gone from a military system of rule of law into the policing. And we're getting the, the desire for community policing, for human rights-based policing, and they're looking to Europe. And um, they see the UAM mission as, uh, like I said, their most important partner. The EU has a huge advantage in, in this role. And it's something that you would always remember is that and this is not me talking, this is the Iraqis, because when you go in, you sit in, we have access to the Ministry of the Interior, uh, the Prime Minister's advisors, the Office of the National Security Advisor, and what we're being told is, you're our important partner. We want to uh, benefit from the EU experience. We want to be exposed to their best practice because you have a clean pair of hands. We're seen as, to use the word neutral, we're seen as having no 
uh, history with Iraq as such and that we're there and that they can follow the example. And are you the only Irish staff member on it? Or the yeah, I'm the only advisor at the moment. Okay. Prior to, uh, prior and during my arrival, there were two other Irish advisors that have, okay. uh, one has finished mission and the other has moved on to a separate po post. Thanks for talking us through that. Just to remind the audience, um, there's a system called Slido. I think there's instructions up there about how to post questions on that. And it allows you to upvote the most popular questions, which is really helpful to try and get the ones that we want everybody to everybody wants to have answered. So please do contribute to that. I'll keep an eye on it, and we'll switch to questions just shortly. But first, I want to ask um, Ambassador Coach Morin about the room where the decisions are made to take part or to create missions like that. We've just heard about one of them, one that's in Baghdad, but there's, there's many of them in different regions of the world with many different rationales, right? And so we're only scratching the surface here. But Coach, can you tell us more about you know, what happens in that room? You're the Irish representative. There's 27 there. They all represent different countries. Has the dynamic shifted at all? Um, is Ireland seen as an awkward member in the room, being, uh, you know, having this neutrality policy? Is there any pressure from EU member states to change that? Great. Thanks, Naomi. And good morning, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that... Uh, under CFSP, Common Foreign and Security Policy, uh, decision-making is unanimous and, and decisions are made by, by ministers, by government representatives. So decisions are made through, through the Council of Ministers. Um, feeding through to that, there are various working groups, and, and sorry to bore with the, with the inner workings of, of the EU and how we work as member states, but there are a lot of different working groups which meet and inform and advise policy. And, and I would see our, our role as both, both shaping policy, and we've heard a little bit from the panel previously about the strategic compass, which is the security and, and defence document which guides uh, EU actions. That's an example of one policy. We also mentioned the civilian compact, which is um, a document uh, recently agreed in the last couple of weeks, which guides um, our civilian assistance missions, and, and Martin is a, is a good example of an Irish um, contributor to one of those missions. Um, so, so I would see our, 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 our contribution as a member state in terms of shaping and, and contributing to the policy development, uh, also looking at the monitoring of it and the, and the implementation of it, looking at checks and balances, contributing um, to that debate when it comes to reviews of, of, of missions and, 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 and both policy and missions, and then looking at the instruments under the policy or the actions that we take under the policy. Uh, so it be it military assistance missions, military training missions, uh, civilian assistance missions, European Peace Facility, uh, PESCO, other instruments. So our, our role is to try and provide guidance. Um, and so the committee that I sit on, the Political and Security Committee, has representatives of all of the 27 member states. It also has a permanent chair from the External Action Service. And it has a representative of the European Commission. And I wanted to say that because I think it's important that common security defence policy is one instrument. It's one part of our common foreign and security policy. There are many instruments, and it's really important for us, uh, and for Ireland in particular, that we emphasise that we take both a comprehensive approach uh, and that we also take an integrated approach. So when we sit in our meetings, we're not sitting looking just at a particular action. We're looking at the whole of a situation. So, for example, if we're looking at Iraq, we're looking at all of what the EU does in that situation. We're looking at... Um, at humanitarian aid. Humanitarian. And, we're looking yeah. at development. We're looking at all of the instruments that we take. In the context of Ukraine, we're looking at all of the assistance measures that the EU has put in place um, overall, being conscious of the macro-financial assistance that's being pri provided to the government of Ukraine, but also the work that's being done on, on the enlargement process and looking at the, the, the European path. And, and if we're doing our jobs right, um, we have to take all of that into consideration. And then in relation to the, the particular security and defence contribution that we can make, that's very much guided by all of those other interventions. Uh, and we look and see then, is there, first of all, is there a rationale? Is there something that can be va added value in terms of how the EU can work, be, be it in a training mission, on a military side, or in an assistance mission? Um, maybe a recent example would be in relation to Moldova, where that's the newest uh, EU assistance mission. Uh, and that's in response to a request from the government of Moldova 
for assistance, particularly in, in, in terms of countering uh, disinformation, which is destabilizing uh, in terms of the country, but also in, in terms of boosting uh, cyber defense capabilities. So it's very much working with the partner countries that we work with, as Martin has said, uh, we're there at the invitation of, of, of the host government, of the, of the third country government, um, and we're looking at it um, in, that, in that context. Can everybody hear okay? I hope so. Um, do make sure to lean into the microphones when you're speaking, panellists. Um, thanks for that, Ambassador. Um, I think, John O'Brennan, you seem like I see you leaning forward like you want to say something. Um, <laughs> is there something you wanted to sort of come in on there? Um, is it... Is it, it, do you want to make, sort of say anything about how Ireland fits into this EU jigsaw in terms of common defence? Well, the first obvious point is that after 50 years of membership of the European Union, Ireland has been transformed and our interests have changed substantially. And my argument about participation in CSDP is twofold. First, it's in our self-interest. We have seen such a neglect of our defence structures over a long period of time that when you're participating in some of these PESCO projects like maritime surveillance, for example, or demining, you're actually improving your own capacity for self-defense and you're contributing also to the potential of our defense forces to contribute even more richly to international peacekeeping. So it is very much in our interest that we participate in PESCO projects um, either as observers or actually within the programs, and I'm very glad to see that that participation has increased markedly in recent years. But the second point, again about our self-interest, is that because the country has changed so fundamentally economically, and we are literally one of the most globalized countries in the world, an island at the center of the world economy, the connectivity and the interdependence that follows from that should dictate that we participate as fully as possible, that our own prosperity, in a sense, to just use the example about cyber threats that Coit and her colleagues uh, work on, is of such scale and significance that we have to participate as fully as possible. And this is where I think the forum actually serves a very important function. It is to actually change the way we think about security from the old model of mere physical security to one that is much more broad-based, one that is much more sophisticated, and that compels us, I think, to take a more sophisticated view of the world. Um, and to bring in the other Martin, Martin Butcher, I'm interested to hear your perspective as someone who's working on against the proliferation of arms and in redu reducing conflict in the world. Do you see EU defence, common defence policy, as a force for good or a force for ill in that? I think there are there are mixed answers to that. Oh, sorry. Is that one working? If that one doesn't work, try the one, one to your left. Is it working now? Oh, it is. Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, I, there are definitely mixed answers to that. And, the, and again, I think I don't look at this as um, just a question about military policy, just a question about foreign policy, but a whole mixture of those things, economic policy, social policies. It, 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 it's a very broad and, as John said, a sophisticated range that are needed. There are definitely um, places where uh, the role of the EU... Um, as seen from the perspective of someone who works on human security for an NGO which is you know, desperately concerned with, with building up human security, that the EU does play a negative role. I mean, the the militarisation, for example, of the control of migration across the Mediterranean is one of those examples. The, the, the stigmatisation of people fleeing conflict... Um, climate change, chaos, human rights abuses um, is, is terrible to watch. And, um, you know, as, as someone from a country that's opted out of the EU but who is a strong supporter of the EU, um, that, that to me is, is sad to watch. Um, you know, there, there are other examples you know, where, where good is being done. Usually where the EU does best, it leans into its history. 
Um, and you know, if we you know, go right back to the beginning and the idea of using economics to prevent war and to bring former, former enemies together um, and, and to get to a point where you know, countries in Europe that were fighting for a thousand years, it's now inconceivable that they would go to war. Um, when the EU leans into that, it, uh, it does well. Uh, uh, another concern, again, um, you know, a North African example, Mali um, is just such a complex, such a complex country, such a complex context um, that, that I, I worry that, that, that really what looks like a reduction of that to... Um, you know, a, a securitized approach um, and something which has made it much more difficult for NGOs like Oxfam to operate there um, is too reductive and, and, and doesn't, so, doesn't solve its goals. Um, and, you know, I, th I think one of the things that, that neutrality has done for Ireland is, is, is to... Um, allow your country to, 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 to form a, a unique and credible path in, um, in foreign policy as a, you know, a really respected international actor and, and that this broad spectrum um, of, of way of looking at problems is, is, is really, I think, an, uh, an Irish strength. Mm. Um, I was struck by what you were saying there in terms of um, migration. Mm. Of course, part of the rationale for many of what the missions that the EU is doing is to try to solve problems at source, particularly problems that are drivers of migration, to stop migration flows into Europe. That's quite a lot of the mm. rationale of what they're doing in the Sahel region, for example. So um, I'm wondering, is Ireland participating in EU missions do you see that as undermining that reputation that you mentioned there about being seen as an, an internationally respected act actor? Or do you think that the EU's involvement is appreciated as complex internationally with some good and some bad? Mm. What do you think? At the moment, I don't think it does undermine that reputation. Um, the, you know, the, the, the approach that, that, that Oxfam takes... Um, you know, in, co in conflict zones is to try and work from the bottom up um, and to involve all sectors of society, particularly more marginalised ones, mm -hmm. in trying to um, you know, both peace build but also um, to do that through economic development and inclusion in society. And I think that's something where we definitely see Ireland as an ally. And Ambassador Moore and I might ask you... Um, so you mentioned decisions are made by consensus um, in terms of EU uh, common and defense, defense and security policy. So that means whatever Ireland decides to do, it's a decision, it's the enactment of a decision that's been made in Dublin, right? Can you say more about how are the decisions made for which project Ireland chooses to be part of and how are they tailored to reflect our priorities and to reflect our particular a foreign policy position. Sure, sure, absolutely. And and you know when a new so if we're talking very practically about when a new assistance measure or a new military measure uh, assistance uh, measure by the EU is is established, um, a lot of discussion happens around that in the preparatory committees that I was that I was describing. But ultimately, uh, the the council makes a decision, and that's a formal legal process. Um, and you know, as I said, it's, it's a, the, these are on the basis of of unanimity. And in terms of the obviously the Irish government position, if there's a military uh, uh, mission to be established and, and, and then an Irish contribution to it, that's an issue for um, for for decision by government in, in terms of uh, in terms of a memo for government. And and I suppose in terms of the contribution and the practical, you know, how do we decide? Where where we where we where we assign personnel. I mean, it, it's quite iterative in terms of looking at the skill set that either the Irish uh, Defence Forces, the Garda Síochána, have uh, our civilian um, our civilian contributors, and then looking to see where is a good fit for us. You know, both in terms of um, both in terms of strategic priorities foreign policy priorities, but looking to see where, where can we best contribute. Um, so obviously in the case of, of, 
of contribution to military uh, missions, the Defence Forces will have a very strong sense of where they have where they have capacity, where they can contribute, how does that match with the overall footprint that they have um, in, in particular areas, um, and also maybe where they can benefit as well. So there's a, there's, a, there's a big benefit in terms of our personnel, the skill sets that they use, the practical experience that they get when they're on missions like that, deploying uh, with other member states, learning from one another, and learning from the host country, and learning from the very you know, significant challenges that, that Martin has described very well in, in some place like Mali. On the, on the civilian um, assistance side, I mean, and maybe just to, to be aware that there is, um, there's a recruitment process in terms of how, how civilian assistance missions are staffed, and I'm sure Martin would have gone through this. Um, and a lot of that information can be found on publicjobs.ie. So in Ireland's case, there's a, from the EU level, in the management of those, of those civilian personnel, there's a database um, that's created to register your interest in, in working. Uh, in that area, and then you may basically get a notification if you've registered on that database. From an Irish point of view, then we will look and, uh, and see um, of those that are interested, you know, where does that match in terms of skill set, um, and, and, and then it's a, it's a recruitment process, so people, people go through interview. It's quite a rigorous process just in terms of shortlisting candidates for, okay. um, for jobs. Um, I, I did want to, because I didn't answer it when you were, in your first question, Naomi, when we were talking about, you know, does Ireland feel under pressure because of our, our, our particular position in terms of military neutrality? Um, I would say, just from my experience, and it's six months experience since I've been in this role, um, my experience that colleagues around the EU table are actually very, um, very um, tuned in to Ireland's particular position and to all member state positions, because we're all aware that every member state comes to the table with its own national position. We have our national position on this issue. Other member states have, have national positions on other issues. And that's a matter of dialogue and debate. And, and when you spend so much time together negotiating, trying to work together, there is a really strong sense of common purpose in terms of being able to allow the EU to act um, and to act in the best possible way. But there's also a really strong understanding of, of where um, particular countries, where particular EU member states um, have, uh, you know, have particular positions so mm -hmm. there is a there is a huge degree of, of, of understanding there I'd like to turn to questions now and I can see on Slido that the most popular question is from James Murphy who's a student um, and James Murphy asks does our minimal investment in defense and lack of security structures uh, for example national security strategy agency advisor mean we are limited in the value that we bring um, who would like to take that one yeah, I think it almost <laughs> goes without saying that that is the case, that uh, if you have very limited capacity, um, not only do you have little to offer, but you actually rely on your partner states to do a lot of heavy lifting. Think about the airlift challenge from Sudan or from Afghanistan previously, where, as Ken pointed out in the earlier session, we had to rely on our European partners. Um, I think Ukraine might have offered Ireland some of evacuation during Afghanistan, which was, of course, before the invasion, as I recall. Yeah. 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 Um, and there's another interesting question, which is about changes internationally, which is, you know, what, what effect might a more isolationist United States president have um, in terms of the importance of Irish participation in EU security cooperation? Because as we've heard from other panels right now, a lot of a lot of countries see the aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine as underscoring that EU defence, common defence, is very, very weak and hasn't been built up particularly, meaning that you know, many EU countries see NATO as the primary security provider still. Um, is that something, Ambassador, that you look forward to strategically? Is that something that the EU member states are taking into account? What could happen over in the US in the next election? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you look at the whole landscape, and you see, you see, you know how how countries are are positioning themselves in, in regard to per particular issues. I think, in, in you know, if we've seen anything over the last eighteen months, it has been a huge degree of resolve in in relation to Ukraine and working very um, very much in collaboration and cooperation. And that's probably meant um, a much closer working relationship, certainly between uh, between the U.S. and the EU in terms of both sharing information um, and and recognizing the value of what one another brings to the table. Um, you mentioned. NATO and, and 23 of the EU member states 
um, are members of NATO, and that, that you know, obviously, uh, that they see NATO as their, as their collective defence mechanism. So each, you know, each member state will look at these issues. Um, but in relation to, you know, the relationship, the transatlantic relationship, I mean, I think the last, the last period of time, uh, the last 18 months, has probably solidified that uh, quite significantly. Um, I don't have a crystal ball as to what happens <laughs> in the future. Um, but I think the, the contacts that we make, you know, across the system, um, be it both in, in, in at, at political level, at Congress in the US, mm -hmm. um, be it at official level, where you have those ongoing contacts, I think that, that helps to, um, to, uh, to solidify relationships. Uh, and even if there are changes in policy positions, you can, to a certain extent, weather, weather some of that with good, with good um, uh, cross-party and, 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 and official level relationships. Thank you. Um, let's take some questions from the floor. I see many hands going up. Um, I'll take them in maybe groups of three. I can see I, you, this man in a suit and a purple tie here in the front row, first of all, maybe. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Matt Carty, I'm the Sinn Féin spokesperson on foreign affairs and defence. Um, just want to make a couple of points, if I, if I can, Naomi. <clears throat> the first is in relation to our own defence capacity. And I think there is crucially important that we distinguish between whatever debates we're having in terms of um, uh, alliances and collaboration and the, own, and the capacity of our defence forces, which are shamefully low. The Taoiseach referenced 9,500 members of the defence forces. That's actually the establishment figure. We're nowhere close to that in real terms, and we're actually facing a recruitment and retention um, crisis. Um, and I have to say, I find it slightly disingenuous then to suggest that because of the systemic underinvestment in our own defence forces, then it almost... Uh, is a bridge then to an entirely separate debate, in my view. At the moment, the Irish um, Navy is involved in a, a mission in the Mediterranean, one that has almost universal support in the Dáil in terms of Operation Irani. But at the same time, there are periods during that operation when we will have one single vessel available to actually monitor all of Irish um, sea, um, sea waters. And that, um, again is nothing to do with a, a, a separate distinct debate and the need to be ke kept um, separate because there is broadly, I think, um, um, a, a conviction that we have to increase um, substantially investment in our defence forces. Even from those of us who value Irish neutrality, neutrality is something that also needs to be defended and protected. And we need to have, uh, we, we need to have uh, you know, the, the capacity in order to do that. In relation to European common defence, Will the panel agree that there are some within the European institutions, all of the European institutions, that very clearly have an ambition to see common defence evolve into a centralised European co command? They're on the record of saying that, in the, um, particularly in Parliament and on, on Council level, and that therefore all discussions that take place um, at a domestic level need to reflect that, particularly because when governments make a decision at a European level, that can have profound implications for governments to come, and therefore there needs to be a collaborative uh, approach to all of these. And does the panel also agree that actually our foreign policy, our independent foreign policy, and our neutrality has actually allowed us to play a very positive and constructive role in the, in the world, um, and particularly when we look at the issues globally in terms of humanitarian aid, peace building, Thanks. conflict resolution, um, that all of these areas. And can I just say, um, Naomi, Government have had five opportunities over these four days to make very lengthy, uh, lengthy and um, unquestioned um, contributions. There has been no formal role for the opposition. I think it needs to be noted. If we're talking about a consultative forum, it should be genuinely consultative. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to take some um, ordinary members of the public. Um, is anyone here from beyond the political sphere who'd really like to ask a question, particularly women? Um, I'd like to bring in some women's voices if there's anybody. Um, yeah? Um, do we have any? Okay, sure. The gentleman in, in the blue shirt here in the, in the middle. Yeah. Am I being heard? Yeah. My name is retired Brigadier General Gerard Hearn. I'd like to ask the panel whether they believe that the true cost uh, to the Irish Exchequer of deploying personnel to CSDP missions is in any way a determinant as to whether Ireland actually deploys and in what strength. I will list the question in a, a very simple um, example. During the three years of the deployments by both the European Union and the UN to Chad, Ireland uh, deployed 450 personnel. 
In the first year, under e the EU CSCP, it cost the Irish Exchequer 58 million euros on the, um, using the Athena process or cost lies where they fall, as it's more commonly known. And for the second two years, under the United Nations reimbursement financial model, the, the, the cost uh, to Ireland was, at worst, cost neutral. So what I'm asking is that, you know, the European Union and NATO and the United Nations have polar opposite means of funding their missions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's take those questions, and then I'll take two more from Slido that I see here that have been upvoted. Um, so who would like to take that last one um, about funding for these missions and how that works? What about you, Martin? Would you like to come in on that? Yeah, the, from what I know, and I'm open to correction, but there's, a, there's 11 civilian missions. There's, there's four in the Middle East. Um, there's four in Europe, and I think three in Africa. There's 11 in total uh, civilian missions. I know that they cost 181 million euro last year. That's the figure I, I, I think I, I heard recently. Um, what is costing Ireland? Uh, I'm the only Irish... Uh, advisor in Iraq at the moment. Uh, I have a problem with that because I think, and um, I think Matt Carty might have mentioned it in either Galway or Cork, he spoke about the experience of the Defence Forces and of the Guards and of all our charitable and NGOs and what we can bring to international missions. Um, I'm over in Iraq and I'm looking at different advisory positions, different roles, and I know people here who would do that in their sleep. Uh, we don't use our reputation enough. We don't take advantage of it. We're highly regarded internationally. Um, I sat in front of a major general one day, and the first thing he said to me when he heard I was Irish was, my mother was very ill in 1980, and she was nursed by an Irish nurse. So that's how far back you know, they can remember, and that's what they consider. If you've done anything for them at all, they remember it. And that's the contribution we can make. And our history is hugely behind us. We've, we've an inherited empathy when we go to these countries, and I see it with different mission members, and some of them are there because um, they're there for professional purposes. They want to further their careers. Some of them, some of them are there because, uh, for financial reasons. I'm there, as my wife says, because it's, it's your last adventure. You're going walking the dog after this. Because I retired, and I wanted to do something at the end of my career. And when I saw, as, as uh, Anya said, when I saw the, um, the job description, the role profile, I said, I, I could do that for a year. And I got the year's leave of absence from home to do it. And last month then, I signed for another year. Because I can see the progress since the new government came in, and I can see the opportunity there. And you get invested. When you're working with the Iraqis and the people, you get invested in them, and you get to know them. And it, it does affect your decision-making as to whether you're going to stay or go. It's not financial for me. It was, it was professional. It was an experience. And I've made friends out there. And... Um, I know I've made friends because when somebody sits across the table from you and you're asking them about their life and what happened and when the US invasion happened and uh, you read it on the news, you see it in the papers, but when somebody's sitting across the table from you and they say, well, in 2008, my father went out to work and we weren't politically aligned, we had no connections, and my father was shot dead on the street by a sniper. And when you're in the process of saying to him, I'm really sorry to hear that of us, you know, and he says, but Martin, he said, before I could get out, my 16-year-old cousin ran out to his body, and he was shot as well. And when you're getting that story across the table, and all of them have a tragic story, you know, and our history is tragic. And when you go over there and sit in front of these people, and you think, you know, is there some small thing you can do? And there is years and years of work ahead in Iraq. There is climate change coming. There, there are water security. The Tigris and the Euphrates comes in from Turkey and Syria. If it's, if it's dammed or prevented from running, the, the water security, their population has gone from 6 million in 2050 to 47 million today. It's projected at 80 million in 2050. So those problems are ahead. So if it's a financial thing, uh, we can't afford not to be over there. We, we cannot afford not to be over there, and the area should be making more of a contribution. And maybe it's, it's not the best environment to work in, and it's hard to get people to go there, but whatever it costs, it's worth it. Because uh, when they do get frustrated with me sometimes, and they always throw one thing at me, and they say, whether well, you realise it or not, we're fighting terrorism for Europe. And when I say, well, you know, how do you make that out? And they say, we defeated Daesh, and they defeated Daesh six, 
going on five, six years ago. And now they're constantly fighting them. I see the reports every day. And there's either a, a capture of a, a Daesh general or some major commander. It's ongoing, it's ongoing, it's ongoing. And what they'll say to you is, if ISIS or Daesh get a grip on Iraq, and they nearly did, it will be a launching pad for attacks on Europe. And that's coming from the Iraqis themselves. They're saying, you have your Charlie Hebdo's, you had the Bataclan, you had the London bus bombings, you had King's Cross, all those lone wolf and all those suicide attacks on, on Europe. You know, like Iraq, they've gone out of the news and they start to get forgotten about. And they haven't been happening. And the Iraqis will tell us because they have the foot on ISIS at the moment and they're keeping it on them. And that's why, and that's coming from, that's not me, that's coming from the Iraqis themselves. So whatever the money it's costing, uh, it's a fraction of what it would cost if we were faced with that terrorist threat being launched from the Middle East again, the way it was after 9-11 or whatever. So it, that's, from a financial point of view, it's worth the money. Regarding the phrase um, that the deputy brought up about um, an EU army, this is something we, quite, we hear about quite often in an Irish political debate. And I'd love to ask uh, John O'Brennan and Ambassador Moran about it. Um, first of all, Ambassador Moran, how many EU mes- member states want an EU army? And what actually, can you say what an EU army is? Like, can you define it? Because... Oh, okay. Um, so, I'm sorry to misrepresent it. That's what I heard. I was looking on Slido, so possibly I confused your question with one there. There is a reference to an EU army there, and it says, could it be defined, and what would it be, and how many, how many member states support it? I'd be interested to hear on you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Naomi. And, and I suppose there isn't an EU army and there isn't a plan for an EU army. And, and we're guided by the treaties of the European Union in this respect. And, and, um, and, and so what, what's, a, what's being developed at the moment is an EU rapid deployment capacity. Um, and that's voluntary in terms, of, in terms of nature, in terms of participating in that. But that really is about strengthening the capability um, of defence forces, military, to be able to work together, both in terms of crisis management, and, and, and Sudan was mentioned um, this morning, but also on very practical things. And I think it's important that you bring it down to practicalities, why we would do this. Um, it's, to, it's to upskill our own defence forces um, to be able to work interoperably. That's a large sounding word, but so that we can work with other defence forces. And that's important both in, in terms of an EU context, but also in terms of a UN context when you're working with other, uh, with other contributing nations, that you have common systems, be it in terms of communication, uh, in terms of how you operate, and that you're working also to the, to the highest standards. So that's, that's uh, the EU rapid deployment capacity is something that's being looked at at the moment, um, and it's being, it's being developed over the next couple of years with a view to having it uh, up and running in by 2025. Yes, please. Come well, there. thanks to Deputy Carthy for two excellent questions. On the first one, are there those in Europe who want to go further with European defence? Absolutely. There's a broad spectrum of opinion, as I suspect there is in this room. But the critical thing is that this area is subject to the veto. And decisions can only be taken by uh, member states in accordance with their own constitutional provisions. So whatever desires may exist in Brussels or elsewhere to move towards a much more robust or muscular common defense, it can't happen without the express consent of each of the 27 member states. But we, we have to be aware, I think, just how much the world has changed since the Russian reinvasion of Ukraine last February. And we have to genuinely confront difficult questions in Europe in the near future. Um, in the previous session, somebody asked from the audience, is there any contingency planning going on in Brussels for a breakdown in the Russian state? The answer to that is no. And I suspect there was a lot of panic across the EU on Saturday when we saw those events unfold. I don't think there is any plan either for um, what happens if the United States withdraws from NATO. And that's a much more tangible prospect than it has ever been before. And it will mean for the first time since the European Union was founded, there will have to be a meaningful debate about common defense. You may remember in the 1950s, predating the EEC, we had a 
viable proposal for a European defense community. It was shot down by the French National Assembly. We could be in an entirely different position, however, two years from now, where the Europeans will have to confront this question, how do we defend ourselves? from Russian aggression uh, on our eastern borders, from a whole range of cyber and hybrid threats uh, that can be ascribed to the global level, and where do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the intensely growing rivalry between the United States and China? These are all very difficult questions, and we're going to be confronted with them, I suspect, sooner rather than later. The second question that Deputy Carthy asks is about our foreign policy. Has it allowed us to play a constructive role in the world? I'm not so sure that's the case. The um, earlier session, again, we heard that one of the reasons that Ireland was elected to the Security Council last time, and the Taoiseach mentioned this in his contribution, was precisely because of that positive kind of um, view of Ireland that has existed for a long time. But Norway, which has been a member of NATO for a very long time, was also elected to the Security Council, and its membership of NATO just wasn't a problem in gathering the votes that were needed in a very um, intense competition. And at times, I really get tired of this holier-than-thou and sanctimonious attitude that we have. Are we really saying that countries like the Netherlands, Spain, Latvia, Lithuania are less moral than us? in the way they behave in the world. Many of our partner states in the EU that just happen to be members of NATO do more heavy lifting where peacekeeping is concerned. They contribute more to international development. So I think we have to stop looking at ourselves as this unique exemplar in the moral universe, and we have to take a very cold-eyed, sober view of the security landscape that confronts us. I want to take the top two. <laughs> I want to take the top two upvoted questions on Slido. Um, the first one is from Dermoid P. I'll come to you next. Uh, the first one is from Dermoid P. Voy, um, who asks, if a foreign power threatens subsea cables in our maritime zones or enters our airspace, who do we contact for assistance without compromising our neutrality? So that's a, an explanatory one. And then we'll take John Boyle from the University of Glasgow next. Who wants to take the first one? Maybe, Coach, could you explain that? How does it actually work? Who do you call? <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> Who do you call? Um, listen, I mean, it's a, it's a, obviously it's a, it's a theoretical question, but I mean, I think the first thing that, that happens is, is establishing the facts and looking at, looking at what has happened. Um, um, you, you know, in, in this case, I mean, I think, I think one of the areas where we benefit from being an EU member state is being able to, being able to share information and share analysis and draw on drawn capacity and that's certainly something that's that's there for us and that's open to us um, and both through you know through the different committees that form up the EU including the the military committee of the EU where Ireland has representative through our, our military representative to the EU those are areas where we can where we can share information uh, but also in terms of in terms of a particular issue um, be it on subsea cables or on cyber or on hybrid or other issues. Um, and, you know, one of the areas that's coming out very strongly out of the strategic compass that I spoke of is that sense of developing um, actions that we can take, um, both in terms of advice, situational awareness is, is, is a really important thing to know where are the vulnerabilities, where are the dangers, and that's, that's a, a body of knowledge that Ireland can, can, absolutely, can absolutely draw on in circumstances like that. And we, in turn, as in EU, can then assist... Um, other member, other other states, and I mentioned Moldova being an example there. So I think the first first thing is in terms of recognizing the vulnerabilities that we have, and then seeing what advice and assistance is available to us. John Boyle was looking for more information about about Moldova. Can you just sum up quickly what is that mission about countering disinformation there? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the one of the the issues that we can see it in terms of in terms of the situation in the world now is just how destabilizing disinformation can be, and we have obviously a lot of information out there on social media, some of it for good and some of it not 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 for good, and and and, and disinformation can be particularly stabilizing to the 
to the security of a state and to its ability to be able to, able to form its functions. Um, so part of the rationale for Moldova asking the EU for assistance was to assist it in building its capacity, both in terms of the situational awareness, which I mentioned, but also how it could respond, what kind of tools it could use. So the assistance mission in Moldova, Moldova is very much around, uh, around that. And Martin Butcher, just mm -hmm. to bring you in, because we haven't heard from you in a while, mm -hmm. would you like to um, say anything about what Ireland should do going forward in terms of and how this EU common defence policy might develop? What would, be a go what would be good for Ireland to do more of? I think I'll, I'll answer that and look, by the, look back at a couple of the other questions and bring them in and come to that. And then, um, one of the questions about the, 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 the credibility that, the, that Ireland has and, um, to operate as a, as a neutral state, um, one, one very good example from the time on the Security Council um, would be that... Um, uh, that something that matters very much to Oxfam, you know, Ireland's diplomacy working with Russia to persuade them to allow cross-border aid into non-government controlled areas of Syria was vital um, and probably, probably couldn't have happened if Ireland was a member of NATO, for example. Maybe it could, I don't know, but, but given the way Russia is, probably not. I think um, actually, the example about ISIS, um, you know, if we track back some of this, it's um, clearly they, in Iraq and in Syria, wherever they pop up, they have to be fought now. But they came out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which, and then were nurtured in Syria. They, Al-Qaeda in Iraq came out of Afghanistan and we see going back 40 years' worth of military interventions by different states in different countries that have bred this threat and then metastasized it. Um, and it ends up on the streets of London or the streets of New York or wherever. And you know, I was a mile from the, the Pentagon wondering what the black column of smoke was on the morning of 9-11. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I understand it from that point of view. But, but the... I think that really highlights that the, 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 as much as being part of a short-term security solution, that the military approach to these kinds of groups is, is not the solution. The solution is human security, um, which means people don't see a need to go to these groups in the first place. And coming back to Mali again, that's, that's, that's one where people have been driven to this kind of group for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but in, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, what, what Ireland should do, I hesitate to be the Brit on the stage saying what Ireland should do, um, but you do a lot of things really well. You do, you know, the, the non-proliferation treaty back in the 60s that you know, was a big part of my working life for many years would not have happened. Um, without Ireland, um, certainly not in the form the, the, that it came in. Uh, that, that, was, um, that was really important. Um, one of the things I do most work on is the effect of explosive weapons on civilians um, in urban areas. And just last year, um, you know, there, was, there was a conference here where Ireland had um, uh, led the negotiation um, a, of a political instrument to begin to get states to think about controlling that, to upholding IHL and strengthening it and making protection of civilians more of a, um, a thing in, in, in um, you know, military planning, military training. And at the moment, it's, it, that's, that's a small thing and it's, it's not a binding thing, but it's a start and it matters. And again, I question whether a you know, uh, an Ireland in NATO could have done that. Oh. Um, so, so I suppose that the, the, I suppose what I'm trying to say is you know, play to your strengths because you play those strengths really well. Okay. <laughs> 
two final questions. Please be brief, because we've got less than two minutes remaining. Um, just the gentleman in the first row, and maybe, yes, I, the, the gentleman with the white hair holding his hand up there. Yes, yourself. Just very quick. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Andrea. Um, and thanks to the panel for your contributions. Uh, Tom Clonan is my name. I'm an independent senator on the Trinity panel. I'm also a veteran and somebody who's writing about peace and security for the last 22 years. And I've travelled throughout the Middle East, the former Yugoslavia and elsewhere, both as, a, as, a, as an Irish soldier and as a journalist. And I echo what Martin said. It does make a difference when you're in the international uh, arena to be Irish because we bring a unique contribution. We are facilitators of reconciliation, of peace building, of building capacity, and that's something that we should celebrate. And I want to thank Martin for his service, being away from his family, the physical isolation of being in, in Baghdad. I think it's an extraordinary contribution. And I was very struck by what he said about the reactions of ordinary Iraqis when they learn that you're Irish. You know, we have this incredible diaspora. We should build on it. And I don't think that it is mutually exclusive. Let NATO do what NATO does. But let Ireland continue to build on the tremendous platform. We stand on the shoulders of giants from our diaspora and from people like Martin and all the Defence Forces and Garda personnel here and our diplomats who've served abroad. And as you say, uh, the only Brit in the room, that you know <laughs> this is something we should do. We should play to our strengths. It is a pity that the opportunity to speak at this event was by invite only. And that's not a criticism of the speakers. Not at all. They're very welcome, and I really appreciate their contributions. But it would have been better if there had been an open call where people like me and others could have had an expression of interest. And because of that, I think there are gaps, and I think that should be noted. However, notwithstanding that, my questions are, it seems to me that the further you are away from the front line, the more mythological you feel that Ireland's unique status is as a neutral. So that's the first question. Does the panel believe that our neutral status is somehow mythical? My second question is, the, the fundamental thing we have to do is invest in our defence forces. I would prefer to level up ambition three, the most ambitious level, and to pay our soldiers, sailors and air crew a living wage so that they can live with dignity and create that human capital to assist us in the world to do peace, reconciliation, peace building and capacity. Thank you. Thanks very much and for wrapping up quickly there. I'm really sorry we don't have any more time for questions because we've actually run over now. I have to introduce the next panel. Um, so the next um, panel is about NATO, Ireland's engagement with NATO through partnership for peace. And I'm going to hand over now to moderator Ken McDonough to introduce the panel. Thank you so much to everyone for their contributions.
Okay, um, we're, we're already running a little bit late, so we might as well try and get started. I've been assured we'll get to add the extra five minutes on at the end of the panel. Um, and I'm also conscious there were a number of questions towards the end of that previous panel we didn't get to. Uh, so we, we'll do our best to make sure people get a chance to have their say in, on the important issues that we're, we're discussing. So before introducing the panel um, and what we'll be talking about, just a reminder of the, the little bit of housekeeping for those of you here all morning. Um, you'll already be aware, but as part of the, the guiding principles of the forum, um, we are trying to operate in that spirit of openness and inclusive contribution, and that any personalized attacks or personalized criticisms um, are unacceptable. Um, I would remind, and we're all conscious again, of trying to hear as many voices as possible, that if we can keep contributions to be brief, be to the point, be a question. Um, I, I, ideally, um, we'll keep things moving as quickly as we can between contributions from the audience, from Slido, and from the, the panel members. Um, I'm sure those of you in the room all morning, you're familiar with Slido, and the instructions are over my right shoulder of how you can access, but there are a number of staff here as well who could, who could help you with that. So as, as you may know, I'm, I'm Ken McDonough. I'm, I'm back again for a second session. I'm earning my free tea and coffee today, um, so I, I won't dwell on that. Uh, this panel is entitled Working with Partners, Ireland's NATO Engagement Through Partnership for Peace. To discuss this, we're joined by, by an excellent group um, of speakers. We have Commander Roberto O'Brien um, of the Irish Naval Service, uh, first female commander in the Irish Naval Service. She has extensive experience onshore and offshore, both at home um, and abroad. She's currently on secondment uh, to NATO, and we, we'll delve into that experience as part of the panel discussion. Um, we also have Professor Andrew Cotty, a Jean Monnet professor in, in UCC, an expert on EU um, security and, and NATO. Um, and finally, we have James Mackey, Director of Security Policy and Partnerships with NATO, which he's been working on um, for, for the last two decades, and it would be great to get his insight on, on the view from NATO. as to Why do you engage with third, third countries? What are the structures that are available, um, and how could they be um, available? So uh, Ireland has been a member of Partnership for Peace since uh, 1999, so we're approaching the 25th um, anniversary. And it was interesting to go back and look at some of the debates in the Arctis um, in relation to that, and where we see many of the same concerns we're hearing in, in, in critique of this forum as well. Um, Ireland's engagement has largely been focused on developing our interoperability with other European states, both inside and outside NATO, using NATO standards to enhance our military re readiness and capability. Um, and we're currently in discussions to cooperate in areas such as maritime security, cyber, climate and security, resilience and critical infrastructure. All of these themes we've been touching on in the earlier panels in terms of what the current security environment might demand us to, to react to. So for the first part of the session, I'm going to ask the, the panel to kind of share their experience and views on Partnership for Peace, on NATO and Ireland's engagement, and then, as I said, we'll open up discussion to the floor. Um, we might start with, with Commander O'Brien. Um, you're currently on secondment, as I said, to the NATO Defence Capability Unit. And I was just wondering, at a very basic level, almost a day in the life, um, can you give us some insight into your experience there? Yeah, it's been an amazing and a huge learning curve uh, once I joined the Defence Security Cooperative Directive as part of the international staff in the operations uh, NATO headquarters. But as you mentioned there, part of that is I'm working on defence and security-related security capacity building. And what does that mean? Um, it means that it's um, a demand-driven initiative that NATO offer to, to uh, countries such as Tunisia, Jordan, uh, Ukraine, um, Iraq, where the countries themselves request NATO's assistance because they have experience in crisis management, disaster response, cyber defence, uh, climate change, resilience, all the stuff that you touched on there earlier, Ken. And my portfolio is um, implementing the defence capacity building package for Jordan and Tunisia, which are quite extensive, but also as well with Ireland's interest in women, peace and security, incorporating the women, peace and security agenda throughout the different initiatives within uh, Tunisia and uh, Jordan. So just bring it down then a level from the political document that is my framework and guidance document of what I, my uh, requirement is, is that I ultimately, using my experience as a military person, but I am uh, assisting the Jordanian Armed Forces, increase their number of women within their armed forces, provide equity and opportunity to the service women of the Jordanians, and putting project proposals together to enhance their training, such as getting them 
leadership courses, instructor, military instructor courses, and providing gender awareness training to the rest of their, their militaries. And then a really interesting project that I'm involved in uh, too, um, may I just add quickly, is uh, for Jordan, uh, developing a project proposal for the Jordanian Royal Military Academy. Um, where there will be accommodation facilities for female cadets and afford them an opportunity to train alongside their male counterparts. So not only developing the project proposals, then you have to, um, I have to negotiate or meet with delegations, the international staff. So that's a whole new uh, experience for myself, being a military person. I'm used to being out on a ship uh, 200 miles off the coast, um, whereas I'm having to deal with the people at the political level and try and get uh, money and funding for these projects and training and uh, highlight the importance that uh, defence capacity building fosters uh, peace and security and stability in the regions. You may ask, like, why are we getting involved? Well, the Jordanians, the Tunisians, and in uh, Eastern European countries have asked for assistance from us, and this is what uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, business is. So it has been very uh, fruitful and rewarding. That, that's re it's really fascinating to get to get that sense of what what the what the day job is, mm. and what the role, what, what your role is in that context. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you, you feel that experience compares or contrasts with your engagement. For example, you were part of UNAP for Sophia That's um, at, at the HQ level. At the, the for, uh, force headquarters level. So I was out on an Italian ship where the uh, headquarters staff was on the, the um, dock landing vessel, the San Justo, and then subsequently the San Marco. So very different in terms of you have an operational role out on the ship and as part of the EU NAV for MED, and then within um, on secondment, a voluntary nation contribution that Ireland has given to implementing defence capacity building packages. Two very diverse roles. One where I'm in uniform out on the ship, um, de uh, dealing with the 45 staff headquarters with uh, 20 different nationalities, and I was the link between the executive officer on the ship and the, the staff uh, themselves. So even uh, I, I realise the importance of communication on the international stage is, is, is vital on, uh, on how you communicate. Uh, similarities to that when dealing with the international staff, but very different, as I mentioned, with the pol political perspective and having to canvas and uh, you know, look for the money to fund the, the projects and implement what their aspirations are to assist these countries um, in enhancing their security and ensuring stability in the region. Maybe just one, one final question then, I suppose, in terms of the, the contrast between your EU posting and your NATO posting as, as an Irish mm. Defence Forces member. Do you find there's any sort of curious looks when you're, when you're at NATO HQ? I think the initial in NATO HQ, and dare I say it, James, will, uh, like, you know, the in-processing, because we're a partner nation at the end of the day, so there's different security restrictions and the, the, the in-processing takes a little, a little bit longer, but that's, that's to be understood. Um, and uh, the fact that they say like that, oh, you're from Ireland, and they're very curious. And I said, well, the Partnership for Peace program enables that, that we can contribute to the defence capacity building and in foster peace and security, which are all things that Ireland want to do, and in particular with driving the women peace and security agenda as well, that it's very uh, dear to Ireland's heart, and so much so even uh, three years ago, Ireland hosted a NATO-led WPS event uh, in the Curra um, in Kildare. That's excellent. Maybe to move to, to the broader picture, and I might, might turn to, to Professor Cotty on this, you, you might give us an insight perhaps to, to that broader context of, of how Ireland's cooperation with NATO is, is perceived. Sure. Thank, th thanks, Ken. I mean, I might just start with a bit even more broadly on sort of what is NATO and the, the politics of NATO. And I mean, NATO is contentious, obviously, you know, here, here in Ireland, but also within NATO and, and maybe globally. But I think you can see, if you like, simplifying somewhat two views of NATO. One is that, you know, NATO is a militaristic, imperial, aggressive alliance. That's one perspective. But, you know, if you look at most of the NATO countries, you know, the view is that NATO is a defensive alliance. Its member states are primarily democracies, and it's contributed to peace and stability within Europe, and that's the view whether you're talking about centre-right parties, the Christian Democrats in um, Germany, for instance, uh, centre-left parties, British Labour Party, German SPD, Liberal parties, and so on. So the mainstream view within NATO countries is that NATO is a defensive democratic alliance, and there's an argument that it has indeed deterred Russia and before that the Soviet Union and contributed to stability in Europe. And I suppose another way maybe of thinking about that is um, think about the people who would like to see 
NATO wound up, who would like to see uh, America pack its bags and head home from Europe. Um, the people who come to mind would be Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and maybe Donald Trump. And I'm inclined to think that if Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and Donald Trump all think something is a good idea, it might perhaps be a bad idea. But anyway, we can come back to that. My, my, my broad point is that you know, the politics of NATO in European countries you know, is, as I say broadly, that NATO has been a good thing and a force for stability within uh, Europe. And then maybe just a comment on Irish thinking or public opinion on NATO. You know, it's clear that there's you know, strong public support for neutrality. We know, you know over decades that probably two-thirds plus of the people, depending on the detail of the opinion polls, support neutrality, and clearly that doesn't, you know, that's not compatible with uh, NATO membership. But that doesn't necessarily equate with the uh, view that, if you like, NATO and the US are the font of all evil in the world. So there's another, if you like, more pragmatic view, which says that Ireland, for various reasons, is not a NATO member and is probably unlikely to become a NATO member, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that NATO is a bad thing, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Ireland shouldn't cooperate with NATO. And we've just heard, you know, some of the practical advantages uh, that cooperation with, 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 NATO, with NATO can bring. And we might sort of explore some of those questions a bit more maybe in the panel. Excellent. Uh, th thanks for that context setting and explaining both uh, sort of the idiosyncrasies of the Irish view of NATO um, and, and that broader concept of, of what NATO is and how it's perceived um, elsewhere. James, I, I might move on to you to, to get your insight from, from NATO's perspective. Um, so Andrew just mentioned there are, there are different ways in which um, non-aligned countries can engage with NATO. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about NATO's view of, of, of these partnerships and what role they serve. Sure, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, NATO is, you know, as was said, it's, it's a, an intergovernmental organization with currently 31 member states and 36 partner countries. Those are countries with whom we've signed a formal partnership agreement. Uh, and obviously for the member states, there's a certain set of obligations that they take in terms of the North Atlantic Treaty that they have. Um, but it is, we want to be very clear that those who are not members of the organization have no sort of obligations towards NATO uh, in terms of the partnership agreement. They are sovereign independent states. But what NATO believes is that if you work with a wider set of countries, a wider set of partners, it makes all of us stronger and safer and more secure. And what we found is that a lot of the challenges we face in terms of international security today don't respect borders. Okay, so if we talk about transnational trafficking in human beings or narcotics, if we talk about small arms and light weapons trafficking, if we talk about cyber defense. And so the point is that NATO wants to work with other countries who want to work with us to try and tackle some of those challenges, and at the very least to just share information uh, about what's going on. And so, uh, as I said, we have 36 partner countries. Uh, they run the full range uh, of, of different countries you, you can think of. Um, in addition to Ireland, you know, we have countries, European countries like Switzerland, Austria, Malta, uh, who are uh, all, again, militarily neutral countries who work closely with NATO. Um, we have a number of partners in North Africa uh, and the Gulf region. Uh, we have in Central Asia. Uh, a number of partners, Colombia from South America is a partner, and then uh, we have some partners in the Indo-Pacific, Japan, Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And what each of those countries does is they look at sort of what type of cooperation they want with NATO. Uh, we run about 1,200 training activities every year, and it's everything from English language training to um, how do you uh, refuel your, your kit uh, in a multinational peacekeeping operation. And so the partner country decides for itself on a fully voluntary basis, we see this menu, we think we'd like to do a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. Uh, and then NATO looks at what the partners requested and said, yes, actually we think that works well. Um, and then, as I said, most of the time it's training uh, or sometimes exercises. But I think the overall goal is to try and exchange information and ideas with countries who want to work with us. And it doesn't necessarily have to always be in the service of sort of a NATO mission or operation. So just to give an example, uh, Colombia uh, is a partner, as I mentioned, from Latin America. Colombia has been very clear they don't want to participate in NATO missions. However, Colombia has said they want to provide 5,000 peacekeepers for UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, and so what they're doing is they're focusing their cooperation with NATO 
on how to prepare UN peacekeepers to go abroad uh, because they've not really had experience deploying abroad before and working with other militaries beyond Colombia's borders. Um, and so, as I said, it's very individualistic depending on each country, but a lot of times it's actually for a, a wider security issue that, than just NATO. One thing just to pick up on that, it, Partnership for Peace itself is, is sort of an umbrella term in, in some ways, and I'm just wondering if you could give us a little bit more insight into the different levels of partnership um, w within that. Sure, as I said, it's, it's very individualistic depending on, because it's up to each country to decide for itself what it wants and doesn't want to do with NATO. I mean, we have, I mentioned 1,200 activities. You know, you have a country like, say, Turkmenistan, okay, which again is a neutral country, militarily neutral country. They maybe do about four or five activities with us per year. Um, and then a country like Sweden, okay, which is, has applied and is an aspirant to membership within NATO, has been invited, um, they may do around like 400 or 500 activities with us per year. Um, and it really sort of depends on what, what each country has as a goal uh, for that area. But a lot of the things, I would say there's sort of three areas where we see work with partners evolving right now. Um, the first is interoperability. Can we work together when we want to work together? in a NATO mission maybe, usually not, an EU mission or a UN mission? You know, do we have the skills and capabilities to work together? The second big area where we do a lot of work with countries is where Roberta is working, uh, which is uh, capacity building. Okay, can we help countries increase their capacity to take care of the security challenges they face as sovereign independent countries? And then the third big area where we're doing a lot of work now is emerging and disruptive technologies. So if we look at things like cyber defense or we look at things like um, new hypersonic missiles or drone and counter drone military activity in space, these are things that all of us are facing challenges to our security on. And we as, a, as democratic countries need to talk about what does this mean? How do, we, how do we defend against this? And how do we defend against this in a way that, that protects and upholds our democratic values? Because oftentimes those who are deploying these things are not in any way constrained by democratic norms or, or human rights norms. Uh, and so we as alliance of 31 countries, as, as was mentioned earlier, most of whom are EU member states, the majority of NATO member states are also EU member states, um, that uh, we make sure that we talk about this as a, as a community to figure out what works. Excellent. Maybe to go, to go back to Andrew, just we, we had some, you know, James has very laid out very well sort of the, the possibilities with the partnership for peace. I wonder, Andrew, if you could speak a little bit on, on Ireland's experience and, and how, how well we've exploited those opportunities or what opportunities might, might still be there. Sure, absolutely. And, and maybe just to, to reiterate, I think, really strongly a, a, a point which James made is that two key things about NATO's partnerships. One is that they're partner-driven. So really, you know, it's not NATO coming to Ireland or to any other partner saying, you know, we want you to do X. It's essentially NATO saying, here's a menu of things that, you know, we're happy to cooperate with partners on. And then, you know, it's, part, it's partner driven. So then it's up to the Irish government to think, yes, we want to partner on this and we don't want to partner on that. So I think, you know, just in terms of people understanding the nature of the, of the partnership process. And then, I mean, you know, there'll be some people, you know, in this room who will remember, you know, some of the debates around partnership for peace in the, in the, in the kind of mid-late 19... 90s, And one of the things that came out of that was, of course, at that point, NATO was very much involved in the Balkans, and NATO had its peacekeeping operations in Bosnia and Kosovo. And if Ireland wanted to be able to contribute to those operations, it had to be able to operate with, uh, with NATO. And our Irish forces served in Bosnia and in Kosovo. And I think in particular um, distinction in, in, in Kosovo, where Ireland had control for a period of one of the sensitive uh, sense, set, um, re regions within, within Kosovo. So peacekeeping, at least historically, has been one of the big areas where Ireland uh, cooperated with NATO. That's declining because NATO's role in these kinds of operations is, is declining, and that, that, that may be a long-term trend. The other thing I think that I would emphasize, um, and James mentioned this word, interoperability, and that's a kind of military jargon word for pe people who, 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 who don't sort of know this business, but essentially that means, you know, can your country's armed forces operate alongside another country's armed forces? And it can come down to things as simple as communication. If you haven't the relevant communication systems, if you haven't the 
protocols, for communication, for sharing intelligence, and so on, it makes it really difficult to cooperate with other countries. So from the Irish military perspective, and if you talk to professional military people, and I'm sure there are people in this room who could speak to us, and possibly um, Roberta m may, may want to contribute, but that being able to operate with the German military, the Spanish military, the, the British military, which might be in the Mediterranean, and, and I think in particular, if you think about it, even perhaps even more than ground operations, if you think about you know, naval operations, the Irish vessel is out there uh, in the Mediterranean at the moment, well, it needs to be able to cooperate with the other EU country vessels which are out there, and they're effectively operating kind of NATO standards about communication, about you know, incidents at sea, and all, all, all of that kind of stuff. And maybe just, maybe we'll come, we'll come back yeah. to the future, maybe, perhaps we'll, perhaps we'll leave that. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I think that's where, is. that's where I'll jump in there, Andrew. Yeah, exactly, that's where Ireland, and as a military person, we certainly have benefited as being partners of uh, NATO because we were involved in the operational capability concept where uh, to ensure a certain standard and interoperability with other um, militaries within NATO. And uh, one of our ships went through that process two years ago and we've had other units throughout uh, the Defence Forces who have gone through and succeeded and reached that level and standard required. So it really proves that Ireland um, as partners can contribute and be interoperable with these, um, these other uh, allies and EU members, as we mentioned, 23 of the 31 are EU members. So it's important and vital that we are able to, to communicate, um, especially when we're out on operations such as EU NAV for med operation in Union. Maybe just to, to pick up on that a little bit, Roberta, because um, one of the questions I did want to ask you was about that knowledge transfer between mm -hmm. those officers who serve um, and are, are deployed or seconded to NATO, those who serve in EU missions, and then coming back into the Irish Defence Forces. How, how well do you think that, that knowledge transfer works and how beneficial do you think it is? Well, I think because of the small size of our Defence Forces, it works very well. And um, I understand that the frameworks and the processes are enhancing and improving. But the, the benefit is, is that you're able to share the knowledge and experience. Like an example is that Ireland is going through the Individual Tailored Partnership Programme. And I've seen it from the international staff on secondment um, as a member um, assisting other countries such as New Zealand and uh, Switzerland going uh, transferring to their ITP. So being able to liaise with uh, my own delegation, Irish delegation in Brussels and discuss with the areas that would be of interest such as we mentioned there, critical infrastructure, the protection of critical infrastructure, cyber defence, climate change, um, human security. These are all areas that I even was able to discuss with the ambassador and head of mission and people in the area that, uh, to corroborate because they do have the direct link with, with James and his staff, but me as a member serving there and being Irish, we tend to keep in contact and pass on what information and knowledge that, uh, that we can share to enhance the cooperation. Yeah, it's one of those strange ways where being yeah. a small nation can be a strength in some ways and that you keep that interpersonal level and making sure, making sure lessons get brought home. Sorry, James, did you want to pop in on that no, at all? That's okay. Or? I agree with what Bertha <laughs> <what Bert, laughs> said. So. That's caused some controversy at some point. <laughs> um, I, I'm just conscious of, of time pushing on and the, the Slido is beginning to look a little bit like Twitter. Um, but before <laughs> going to, to the, the written contributions, I'd like to open up to the floor. So I think it, the contribution down here at the front... Um, a, a lady there in glasses in white as well, Ben. And uh, I just can't that people who contributed before I might go to someone else. So the gentleman in the pink shirt then. Uh, I'm a Dublin city councillor here for Sinn Féin. I have to say, um, listening to, to this uh, panel, um, NATO sounds more like a Boy Scout and Girl Scout jamboree than what it actually is. Um, let's not forget, it's a nuclear-armed military alliance. And as a city councillor, I have to say that the organisation represented by one of the panellists is not welcome in this city. NATO is not welcome here. And it has no place and should have no place in Irish foreign, foreign policy or defence policy. And that is, that is fundamental. Uh, it is not a case of sugarcoating NATO, which an attempt has been made to sugarcoat NATO in this forum and on this panel. Let us not forget also that while thankfully the armed conflict which we had in this country is over, part of our country still has NATO troops in it and there is a constitutional conflict still in this country. So in no way 
will the Irish people in any way be induced or, or uh, connived into NATO? Because this forum is an attempt to soften us up and to continue the NATO membership by stealth. It may not be open membership, but it's NATO membership by stealth. It's the entanglement and participation uh, of our honest, defense is, is forces there there? in NATO. So that's the point. And what I want to say is there will be a constitutional referendum to strengthen Irish neutrality in the constitution. That's it. The lady with the glasses down there, we'll, we'll take a couple of questions. Just down there in the middle there. Thank you. Bridget Lawson, European University Institute. Could I ask the panel, the NATO is about to establish a centre for seabed surveillance. We know that Irish economic waters, our territorial waters, are much larger than the state, and we're a gateway, uh, we're an Atlantic nation. What would the panel's response be to the kind of cooperation we should have with this centre in our own interests and in the interests of the security of our neighbours, or is it something that we should not be involved in? And then I think there was just a third question, the gentleman in the pink shirt there. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, there seems to be, an, in, in the general uh, discussions that take place... Sorry, sorry, do you just mind introducing yourself? Sorry, Dermot Nolan is my name. Uh, there seems to be, in the general discussions that take place uh, it, it, today here as well, uh, that geopolitics started on February the 22nd uh, la in 2022. It started with that. Uh, in fact, it didn't start with that. Uh, since the Second World War, there have been something like 280 wars. 80% of them, 80% of them were started uh, and involved, generally speaking, started, but certainly involved the United States. That's NATO. Uh, the other point about that is that something between 30 and 50 million people were killed in those wars. And this is the alliance that they're asking us to join. There are even gross absurdities. The last time uh, that uh, a major uh, dominant partner in a military alliance attacked one of their own members was when the, when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968. But since then, it's happened again. The United States attacked Germany, by blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines, they attack their own ally. The whole thing is appalling. So <clears throat> we do not want to get involved with people like that. And I, and I agree with Michal Matthonica. NATO is not welcome here, and you're not welcome here, sir. Um, I would just refer everyone again to the, the forum's uh, ground rules around principles of respect and not personal attacks. Uh, James is very kindly giving us time. Uh, we do just one more question here if, uh, for Patricia McKenna there. Thank you. Um, I hadn't intended a, a asking a question, and I mean, to be fair to the people who are participating here, they're invited. Uh, our gripe would be with the government who have organised a very unbalanced uh, uh, forum where only one side are really taking prominence. Um, and on that, I just want to say that, in, and, and I'm sorry this is not in relation to this session at all, but in relation to the last session, which was extremely interesting. There were a number of women who wanted to ask questions from the floor. We had a woman chair who didn't let any of us in, despite the fact of asking, and and I wanted to make this point because when uh, Bridget Laffin, Professor Bridget Laffin, who's um, you know, a, a, a Jean Monnet professor, EU Jean Monnet professor, her colleague uh, in the last session, uh, basically, and that's what I wanted to come back to, but he's not here. He's not here, and I can't. He's not here, and I can't ask the question of him. But I think it's very important that the the point is made that. And it's no disrespect to the participants. It is not your fault, but it's a very unbalanced forum funded by the taxpayer to get a certain agenda. And I think we have to be careful of that. The European Union has, from day one, wanted a militarised Europe. It's getting it, and our government, unfortunately, against the wishes of the Irish people, are supporting that. I, I think we got one question. Um, 
you know, we've, we've had, I think, some, some very clear contributions, and it shows where, where the public debate is um, in relation to NATO uh, and the way it um, raises, raises hackles in particular ways. So we might go back to, to Bridget's question about whether we should participate um, in, in this new centre in relation to sub, subsea maritime cables and security. Um, perhaps, Andrew, I might throw that to you first. Sure, absolutely. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to actually not, not swerve, to some extent, the, the other issues that, that, yep. that, that, were, that, that, that were raised. I mean, I would just make one point. As I tried to sort of say in my initial intervention, I think that, they're, they're, you know, you, simplifying somewhat, you could say maybe there are two views here in Ireland. One is, you know, no to anything to do with NATO. Fair enough. I mean, that's a legitimate the view, a view and should be expressed, and a view that Ireland is not and is probably very unlikely to become a NATO member, but should partner with NATO. What I would note is that Ireland joined Partnership for Peace in 1999. Um, that's almost 25 years ago, and in you know intervening elections, um, the public has generally given more votes to those parties who support partnership with NATO as opposed to those who, who, who don't want anything to do with NATO. So I think, you know, that, that's maybe just worth reflecting on, you know, the, the politics of, of, of this he, he, here in Ireland. And, you know, I will see, see if I get further response to that. On, on, on the, um, the Bridget Laffin's point about the seabed surveillance, there was a very interesting panel on this broad issue of maritime security on the first day of this event in Cork. One of my, I think, big sort of views on this is that right now, no one knows how to do this stuff. The infrastructure has developed ahead of our ability to monitor, protect, secure it, and we're having to kind of run pretty fast in terms of policy development to try and keep up. And I think, you know, NATO is going to be one of the places where thinking around policy on this issue is developed. So I think it would be a mistake, in my view, for, for Ireland to exclude itself from engaging on that. The other thing I think to note is that, and James may have more detail on this, although even I think you know, these things are always being developed day by day right now at the moment within NATO, but my sense is that it's more likely that NATO will have a kind of policy development thinking kind of dialogue role around this rather than NATO itself will have a very strong operational role in that it will be NATO's job to defend cables or, or, or infrastructure. And I think, you know, my view would be that it would make sense for Ireland to be plugged in to that policy development and thinking piece of work, which is, is, is what NATO is likely to engage in, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, I, I thanks for the comments, and I understand that this is a very emotive issue for a lot of people because what we're doing is we're talking about the security and safety of our societies and our citizens. So I very much appreciate the, the passion that, that has been brought to this. Um, what I can say is uh, in 20 years of working at NATO headquarters in Brussels, uh, the issue of Irish membership in NATO has not once been discussed, has never come up. Because Ireland is a sovereign, independent nation, uh, and it chooses its own security policy under the United Nations Charter. But what I would also say is other countries also have that right under the United Nations Charter. And so we have tens of millions of Europeans who have made a sovereign choice to join the alliance because they believe that is in the best interests of their security. They were not forced to do so at gunpoint. They chose that through democratic processes. And I understand their, their, their situation, right? They were concerned about Russian imperialism. And we've seen what happens when Russian imperialism comes along and, and kills, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing that effect in, in Ukraine right now. So um, I think that that is a little bit the, I, I would say, the basis upon which we have seen a number of countries who uh, have asked to join the alliance. But again, as I said, the issue on Ireland has never once been discussed in the time that I've worked on the issue. So uh, there's no plans there. Um, the second thing I'd just like to say, um, NATO does not equal the United States. Uh, it's 31 sovereign countries who have all come together, uh, and it's a consensus-based organization. Uh, and then I think the last thing on the, on the infrastructure, I, I think 
it's very much along the lines of what, of what you had said, is it's very much about sharing information with each other. Another example I can give is we have something called the malware information sharing platform at NATO. Okay, and what we have is the NATO countries plus some of our partners contribute information real time about some of the worst malware that we're seeing come out. Okay, and it allows us to inform the different governments about how they can pre protect their systems in as quick a, a time as possible. Um, and I do think that it's a little bit similar with the critical undersea infrastructure. That is nine times out of 10 going to be a national responsibility, right? Because it falls within the territorial waters or the exclusive economic zone of a particular country. But the important thing is to share information about the potential threats and challenges so that countries are able to take care of the security of, their, of, of themselves, of, of their country. Thanks. Okay. I've had a couple of hands come up while we, were, while, while we were talking, so I might go to those first, and then I'll turn to the Slido, which is here at the front. The mic is just coming to you now. Ray Cronin, uh, Sinn Féin TD and junior spokesperson on defence. Um, I think it's notable that most of the people who are in support of neutrality are contributing from the floor and the majority opinion of Irish people in continuous polls is not represented on the panels and I mean that with no disrespect to, to the panels at all. You know, you're entitled to your opinion but you know, as I said, the majority position of, peop of the Irish people in continuous polls is in support of neutrality, yet that is not the majority opinion of the, of the panels. Um, I also think that, um, that uh, you know, I grew up in the, the last question here on, on your page is how does the decision of Finland and Sweden to join NATO impact on European security and what are the implications for Ireland? <laughs> what? You know, I, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s in the middle of the Cold War um, and there was, there was no talk about Ireland joining NATO. There was no push, push towards that. Like we have to remember that the EEC started off, um, actually was, was born out of the wreckage of war. It was formed to, to, to stop us killing, killing um, our fellow citizens in fields um, and you know there, there was it's, the, that mis the, the mission creep has started now and it's very much towards, towards militarization. And I'd like to ask the question, um, should the EU look within itself at the, ri the rise of the far right among, among Germany, France, um, and Italy as well? And should we be actually looking within, really, to see how we, how we can improve ourselves? Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. And just one more question down over here, and one at the back as well. So we'll take the gentleman on the right first. Yep and then right, right at the back. Uh, Tom Crilly from the Peace and Neutrality Alliance. Um, I agree with some speakers there. It, does, it doesn't seem like a fair and balanced um, or the, um, set of speakers we have there. And I think we should have had a citizens' assembly and we might get more fair and balanced within the audience structure as well. But my point is, um, and NATO has been uh, portrayed as a, a Disneyland run by Santa Claus. Like it's, it's, it's a lovely organisation. Uh, there is pressure on all European countries to abandon neutrality, to support NATO and the, their sanctions against Russia. Most people in the global south wish to remain neutral. They oppose Western post-colonialism, exploitation and imperialism. They see the war in Ukraine as a struggle between two empires, NATO and Russia in Ukraine. A horrific war where thousands are being slaughtered every day. They want a ceasefire and neg negotiations now. Recently, Finland's foreign minister threatened Africa, support Western, the Western position against Russia, or we will cut all, uh, cut all your development aid. Now, how does NATO answer that? Like, you know, if, if countries in Europe, Europe, in the EU, are putting pressure on Africa, who, want, who I think is great that these nations are coming together, they want to build their uh, economy, build trade, they want to build dams for electricity, they want trains to, uh, across the continent, and all we want to do, or all NATO wants to do, is to send weapons and military uh, intervention into, into that country. We destroyed Libya, we created chaos, NATO destroyed NATO, uh, 
Libya. US uh, uh, led uh, another intervention war, destroyed Libya. We created a horrific mess, and now we're trying to mop up with little uh, kind of NGO efforts to the mop up. Instead of us coming out straight, it's telling the US and NATO, stop these wars. Let's work for peace. Thank you. And we have a question down at the back here. and I'm head of political science at the University of Galway. Um, I have a question, maybe for James, but the other people may want to come in, and that is um, neutral Austria and neutral Finland. They're two neutrals who are really interesting from an Irish comparative perspective because they seem very likely to keep their neutrality. There's no debate about moving into NATO. So in other words, they're very unlike Sweden and Finland, who we hear a lot about. I'd be fascinated to know about their partnership because if I'm not mistaken... Austria has, I don't know so much about Malta, but Austria has an extensive and very deep ambitious partnership with NATO. And they don't see that in any way as inconsistent with their neutrality. They, they, they collaborate very extensively, up to the point, if I'm not mistaken, of actually purchasing arms collectively with, with NATO in order to get savings and in order to make sure their defence forces are properly equipped. So why couldn't we do that? If Austria could do that, why couldn't we do some of that? Thank you very much. By the way, James, personally, I come from Galway. You're very welcome to come to Galway. <laughs> okay, so we, we, we have a collection um, of questions there. Perhaps to start with, with Deputy Cronin's question about that, that question of values and the difficulties within both NATO and the European Union, um, where we have trends or, or tendencies towards liberalism, towards certain amounts of authoritarianism. I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer to jump in on that one. I think Andrew is the academic, you're the one who's free to speak. <laughs> I have a little, little, little more free, free freedom to speak than my, my, my co-panellists. I mean, like, like, ab absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 if you ask me for my highest value, I'm a Democrat, and I believe in democracy and, 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 and human rights. And shifts towards populism, illiberalism, authoritarianism in, there are some even here in Ireland, thankfully on a smaller scale than some, 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 some other countries, but you know, Germany, United States, many, many European countries, they're, they're deeply, deeply worrying. How the EU and NATO respond to those is much more challenging, and it partly goes back to James's point that NATO, but also the EU, are made up of sovereign um, countries. So, you know, NATO or the EU can't just go in and sort out Turkey's problems with democracy. And more substantively, I mean, if anyone's, you know, fo followed this issue, think about the, um, the democratic retrenchment, the, the stepping back from democracy in um, Hungary and in Poland. The EU is struggling with how it responds to that, and it's not an easy issue. So it, it's absolutely a worrying issue that we see trends towards illiberalism, authoritarianism, populism in, 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 in Euro European countries. There are no easy answers, and certainly not for NATO or, 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 or for, the, for, the, for the European Union. Thank you. Maybe to pick up on, on, on the second question then about the, the interlinkages between, I suppose, security objectives uh, and other objectives in international foreign policy. Now, we heard earlier on today about the EU and the comprehensive approach and the integrated approach of starting to tie together the different tools the European Union has. To what extent, and maybe this is a question for, for James, um, to what extent are, is, is NATO's toolbox limited because it's, it's, it's a military alliance primarily? Sure. I mean, it is limited, and uh, it's also reflected in the number of staff we have, uh, which is significantly lower than that of the European Union, because the European Union is a, a much broader organization, right? It handles uh, economy, social security issues. Um, it's, it's a massive trade organization, um, and that is reflecting the, the, the very different nature. And I think the EU brings a, um, a very different and actually, I would say, complementary uh, set of tools to each and every one, which is also why we have focused so hard on trying to make sure that there is a strong complementary relationship between NATO and the EU. So if we look, for instance, at the rebuilding of Ukraine that is going to have to take place, um, both NATO and the EU are going to have to be involved in that. 
if we want to build a strong and, and stable uh, Ukraine going forward and help the Ukrainian people to reconstitute their country following this horrific aggression. Um, and um, so, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking to our EU colleagues. And, and the best case where I can see NATO and EU working together is where we identify, for instance, a need uh, in a country uh, where, uh, like take for instance, cyber defense in Republic of Moldova. The Moldovans came to us and they said, we're, we're, we're in a desperate strait, we really need some help in terms of improving our government-wide cyber defense. And NATO and the EU together looked at that problem figured out what each one could bring to the table and worked with the Moldovan government at their request to provide advice, assistance, training, and equipment uh, on cyber defense to help Moldova improve its capacity. And so that's sort of the best of NATO-EU cooperation is when we each bring different skill sets to the table. But if you look at the rebuilding of Ukraine that's going to have to take place, it's going to require a whole of government, a whole of society, a whole of Europe effort to try and help the Ukrainians rebuild. And, and again, I just sort of want to say, I mean, it was mentioned a little bit earlier about, well, why can't we just stop the two sides that are fighting? Th this is not two sides fighting. This was an armed aggression by an imperialist power which has violated the United Nations Charter, which has kidnapped 30,000 children from Ukraine, uh, and which on a daily basis is bombing civilian infrastructure. So the idea that somehow we just need to find a peaceful way out of this, you know, on an equal footing between the two powers. Um, Ukraine is, is upholding the UN Charter right now by itself. It's fighting for its, its right, its survival, uh, and its right to self-defense. And NATO is going to stand by Ukraine and help it exercise its right to, to self-defense under the United Nations Charter. I'm tempted to say here, here, but I have to appear, appear impartial on this. But uh, full, full disclosure, my wife is Ukrainian, so um, you know I, 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 do, I do struggle with the, the both sidism in, in, in those kind of arguments. To pick up on, on the comment from, from, from the back um, and the question around comparing Ireland's involvement with Partnership for Peace mm -hmm. and that of, of Austria and, and Malta, I think, were the two examples. Uh, Switzerland, I think, the, the, yeah, the, uh, was, uh, was Austria and Switzerland. Oh, so it was Austria yeah. and Switzerland. No, I, I'm happy to address that. I mean, again, it, it's each country has the right to choose or not what it does. Um, and so uh, we have a pretty deep partnership uh, with Switzerland. And I will actually say it's not that there's a comparison, okay, but I would actually say Switzerland probably does more of those activities with NATO than Ireland does um, because Switzerland has decided that that's what it wants. But again, it's completely and totally up to each country. In particular, Switzerland and Austria have quite a strong interest in the security of the Western Balkans region. And uh, both of them have contributed uh, peacekeepers to NATO uh, UN Security Council sanctioned missions in the region, as has Ireland uh, in the past. Um, and so um, for those two countries, they've decided that neutrality doesn't mean isolation, um, but they want to work where they can with NATO. And again, as I said, it, we just present the list of activities, and then it's up to those countries to decide what they want to do or not. Switzerland, in particular, has a, a very large high-tech sector um, and is quite dependent uh, also in terms of its own cyber defense and cyber security, given its position as a small country which is connected globally. Um, and so it has asked us for, um, to work collaboratively. But Switzerland brings a lot to the table for NATO as well. They bring expertise, a different position. Um, and, and so for us, it's worthwhile to also talk to the Swiss about what they do. Um, but again, I, you know, we don't make it as a comparison. It's really very much up to each partner country to decide for themselves what they do or they don't want to do with NATO. Thank you. Uh, so I might turn to, to some of the questions that have come through um, on the Slido. Uh, the current uh, top ranked one is from Connor Daly, who describes himself as a student. I think we, we all are, and I hope we all aspire to continue to be. Um, and it's about the question of well, why, why there's such a visceral reaction in, in Irish discourse. And we've had you know, some of this from the contributions today to any interaction with NATO um, or indeed with other international, um, international initiatives. I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer for that, but again, Andrew, I'm looking at you as the, <laughs> the person with the, the, the freedom to, 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 to put forward. Um. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> well, I, I couldn't possibly know what the correct alphabetical order is because Anonymous has not provided their name. And in line with policy in previous panels, I was going to stick with those who've, who've put their name to your question. I don't think we need to have a debate about the standing orders for, for, for running this. So if you want to address that top question. And we'll come back to it because there's a few questions there around NATO's record that we'll touch on. Um, I will address it and I'll draw on two people, one of whom is actually in the audience and I hope she won't mind me drawing on her. Um, firstly, I'll draw on the Irish historian Joe Lee and probably I imagine many people possibly as in their time as, stu as students might have studied or read Joe Lee's book on 20th century Irish history and in preparing for this I was actually flicking through that and look, look, looking, looking at, um, at you know, what Joe Lee... And, I mean, Joe Lee said that the Irish people, for whatever reasons, had developed what he described as a kind of somewhat moralistic or maybe moralising approach to um, neutrality. And then, secondly, Bridget Laffin is in the audience. I hope she won't mind me bor borrowing from her, but she said, I think, in the last few days that, you know, one of the sometimes problematic things with Ireland's approach is its um, unwillingness or perhaps failure to put itself in the shoes of some of its European partner countries. And you might think here about Finland um, or um, the, 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 the Baltic states. Um, and, you know, if you think about the Baltic states, Ireland, of course, you know, has experience of imperialism, the Baltic states, too, have experience of imperialism, and that's, for very understandable reasons, um, led, 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 led them to, 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 to want to join, join, join NATO in particular. So there may be something, it, it, as Joe Lee put it, you know, in the way in which debates around new, neutrality have evolved in Ireland over, over decades that, that, that took them in a particular um, direction that perhaps pushes towards, as, as the questioner points out, this kind of viscer visceral reaction to NATO. And I suppose I return to my very initial remarks, which I suppose wanted just to highlight the point that those kinds of views of NATO are way outside the mainstream opinion and view of NATO in most European countries, which was really, really my, my initial point at the very beginning of, of, of my remarks. Thank you. Okay, um, maybe moving on, there, there, there are a couple of questions that touch on NATO's record in, in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Libya, um, and elsewhere. Perhaps, James, do you, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, we'd have to sort of address them each individually in terms of, um, you know, success or not, and also what could have been done better. But I think that one thing is it's really important when you talk about these different scenarios to look at the entire record and context Okay, just to take one example, okay, the NATO mission in Libya, okay, why did it start? Because there was a threat of an imminent humanitarian catastrophe in the eastern part of that country. And, and then also, I mean, we need to look at what happened after in all of those. It's, you, you need a whole of international society effort uh, in order to try and address the challenges. NATO is a military instrument. It's used when its allies agree that it should be used or not. But NATO is just one tool in the whole toolbox that we have in terms of the international community. We mentioned the EU and the tools that it brings. The United Nations brings a significant tool set and also international legitimacy in terms of peace building. And I think it's incumbent upon us, and it was mentioned this morning, some of the new challenges we face uh, in terms of climate change and the impact on security that we really need to think as a whole of international community, how are we going to address all of these challenges together? Because um, they will continue. We will continue to face scenarios um, where there is mass population movement, where there are militia that are killing uh, innocent civilians and, and uh, violating the rights of women. Um, and, and we as an international community need to decide um, how are we going to handle that? Um, and I will tell you, quite honestly, I don't believe that NATO is the first response in most of those cases. That's my personal view. But we do then need to have an answer as an international community, as a United Nations, and hopefully with a functioning United Nations Security Council, 
to how do we address those issues? Because unfortunately, we've seen over history, these challenges will not go away, and with climate change, are likely to increase the, the complexity and severity of the challenges we face. Andrew, you said you wanted to come in there? Yeah, so on, on the question of NATO's interventions, um, you know, NATO's various interventions have been contentious. We can debate whether they were right or wrong. On the Libya intervention, I think it's worth remembering that at the point when NATO in, intervened, Colonel Gaddafi was still um, in power. You'd had an uprising in uh, Libya. Colonel Gaddafi, and I think the quote was, threatened to um, kill the opposition like rats in the sewer. So, you know, NATO... I think genuinely believe that it was trying to intervene to prevent, to prevent something worse. Whether I'm, for me, the jury is out on, on, on the NATO intervention in, in, in Libya in um, 2011. But for those who are against intervention, um, pause to think about Syria. Um, I don't necessarily think that we should have intervened in Syria, but non intervention is not a panacea. Look at how many hundreds of thousands of people killed in Syria, war crimes, use of chemical weapons by the um, Assad regime, half of um, Syria's population uh, displaced. So to suggest that you know, non-intervention is always the right answer and that there are no downsides to not intervening, I think we should pause for thought. And then maybe to mention one other example, um, Srebrenica. About seven or 8,000 unarmed Muslim men or boys killed by the Bosnian Serbs in Srebrenica in 1995. NATO's intervention in Bosnia thankfully brought an end um, to that and at least partly stabilised the situation in Bosnia. So all I would say is that these questions of military intervention by NATO, but also you know, by ad hoc coalitions, sometimes by, by, by the UN, they're very difficult questions, in my view, with no easy or simple answers. But the answer that, you know, the, the approach which says that, you know, all of this is the US's fault or NATO, NATO, NATO's fault, in my view, is not persuasive. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm conscious we, we have about five minutes left in, in the session. There are two, sort of the next two most popular, although Rory Connolly has done a, a late charge up to the front in the, in the last couple of minutes um, that I'd like to address and maybe give each of the panellists an opportunity to respond. And I've had one indication from the floor, the chap with a beard down there. Um, so if you could make a, quite, a, ni a nice, succinct, sharp question so we can give people a chance to, to answer it, that would be great. Uh, I don't want to disappoint. I suppose it's not as much of a question. Sorry, if you could um, introduce yourself. And Sorry, if it is a is comment, I'll ask them to turn off the mic. Uh, my, my name is Fionn Dempsey. I work in the European Parliament on security and defence issues. I, I don't want to disappoint uh, in that my, my intervention isn't as much of a question as it is. Uh, I just wanted to challenge the narrative um, that we've heard from the, 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 the top of the, the room on the NATO intervention in Libya. The question that uh, that was a response to was actually about the consequences of the NATO intervention in Libya, which, if you r read the literature, you know, it, it's not a confined conflict. In fact, the 2011 intervention in Libya, which was led by many European Union member states as well, contributed to systematic insecurity across North Africa. And many of the EU's uh, common security and defense missions in the Sahel are purportedly addressing the, the insecurities, systematic insecurities that were brought about by that intervention. And when you, when you mention that there was a, the, the threat of a humanitarian catastrophe, what we have seen over the last uh, decade uh, emanating from that intervention has been a, a humanitarian catastrophe. I'd also like to address the, the narrative over Syria, that, that this was a, a war in which there was no intervention, because you know, you'd only have to go to the pages of the Washington Post to see the enormous uh, component of the CIA budget that went into arming and training uh, people on, on the opposition side of that conflict. So it's not as if there hasn't been interventions in that conflict either, and wh whatever position you take on it. And lastly, uh, just the... the um, the statement that uh, 
members have joined NATO, have acceded to NATO in a democratic fashion. I think there's a lot of people in the anti-war movement in Sweden and Finland who would challenge that assertion because the, those decisions were taken without consulting the people of Sweden and Finland on, on, the, on the question of accession to NATO. So it's, okay. you know, I think it's, it's important to point that out. I, I'll be very glad to point out we have a panel in the afternoon where colleagues from Sweden and Finland will talk to their experience and their, their experience of accession. Um, so just to go to the question that we have on the Slido, and I think this will have to be our, our last one. Um, it's, I've got to take Rory and Kieran's ones together here, which is the, what additional engagement with NATO could be leveraged to help develop Ireland's capabilities and improve its capacity to conduct peacekeeping operations? And maybe the second question to, sorry, sorry to um, so, summarize Kieran or editorialize, you know, what are the costs of not engaging in either EU or, or NATO initiatives in this space? Um, so, Roberta, do yeah, you want to and, and I think that uh, we've touched on it earlier um, in terms of uh, critical infrastructure and cyber defence, that it's vital. The technology is moving so quickly, and even NATO and the EU are grappling on how they're going to tackle the, the security and um, ensuring the safety of the undersea cables. And um, I think that Ireland could leverage this with our engagement through Partnership for Peace. There's the thematic groupings and that we certainly would engage at the policy development level for the protection of the critical infrastructure. So I see that that is a way forward in enhancing our capability and capacity. Certainly as a naval service person, I see that there are gaps, particularly in the area, and we do need to engage with other nations that have similar large um, sea masses, such as uh, Portugal and our neighbours close by. And uh, sharing and collaborating of information, I think, is vital in, in that area in particular, and that's where it would be of benefit to Ireland. Andrew, do you want to come in on those? Um, I think probably the two areas where I'd see sort of more potential for cooperation with NATO would be, as mentioned, the maritime and related, and then also I think cyber is, 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 the, is the other one as well, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. James? I just sort of say that I, I think Ireland should be extremely proud of its record in international peacekeeping. Um, and I think uh, we've heard certainly from a number uh, of members of the armed forces as well, uh, the defense forces, uh, who have talked about how proud they are to, to be involved in that work. And I think one of the things that the Defense Review in Ireland last year looked at was how do we keep our, our personnel safe uh, and how do we make sure that we're, we're able to continue deploying to peacekeeping operations in a safe manner in the future? And so I think that's probably going to be an area where we need to continue to look and see is how is peacekeeping changing? What is the threat that we're facing from violent extremist groups that are trying to increasingly attack peacekeepers, including UN peacekeepers in Africa, for instance? Um, and the thing is, the last thing you want to do is deploy your peacekeepers and then have them attacked and, and you know, potentially take casualties. So you've got to make sure that uh, your, your troops are safe, have the best training that they have, and, and that they're able to do it. And, and I think that that is probably going to continue to be one of the main areas where Ireland looks to work with NATO um, in you know, remaining fully neutral country, but wanting to uphold the UN system and provide a good number of well-trained UN peacekeepers for the future. Thanks. So um, our conscious time is against us at this point, and lunch, I believe, is waiting somewhere, or at least I hope so. Um, so I'd like to ask you to, to thank the panelists for their contributions. Uh, and thanks also to the audience members for staying engaged and, and for your patience in, in allowing this panel to run over a little bit, a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs>